of day one of the trial was smugglers uh, helicopter escape plan that was across the tabloids uh i couldn't even kill myself in in this jail i actually wanted to escape just to kill myself i had to develop a bit of a system to get over these internal walls it had a another moat on the inside of the prison that ran around it was actually a sewer and that had barbed wire in the middle and i couldn't figure a way of getting um my ladder over to the other side but when i got out of that cell but when i, when I squeezed through the bar into the night and looked up at the sky that i hadn't seen for what, almost two and a half years i'd never seen the night sky I'd never seen stars or anything and then look back into the cell with the people i knew in there i thought suddenly it was all finished it was all gone that didn't matter anymore. My survival out here was what mattered. Hey, this is Matt Cox. I am with David McMillan. He has escaped two prisons where he was on death row, and it's going to be a really interesting podcast. I hope you check it out. Thank you very much. Hello, Matthew, and thank you for um, taking me even by wire to um, Tampa in Florida. Um, and I think you've introduced me a little bit, but just to let people know, I'm now quite ancient, but um, from the age of 20, um, you know, they say up until you're uh, 18, you uh, are looking for trouble, but after 18, you find it. And I, I certainly did. I, I um, traveled around smuggling, uh, made just about every mistake that's possible, and um, found myself in Bangkok, Thailand, um, looking at a death sentence, in fact, only a couple of weeks away from a death sentence. Um, got out of that one, which we'll talk about, I guess, and <laughs> did I learn anything? I guess I must have, but did it stop me? No, I was in uh, Karachi in Pakistan several years later, uh, looking at the death penalty there. Was that an escape? Not in the literal sense that it was in Thailand, but as we'll find, it was in some ways more difficult. Okay, so um, just the accent and your appearance and the fact that I've read maybe, I think there's like 20 books that were written by, I can't believe I can't remember. You know the, the, the character of Sean Dillon? Hmm. Not exactly. Oh my gosh. Are you, are you, you're you going to know, I have to look this up. I'm sorry. Hold on. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, right. Matthew uh, was looking for, is it a fictional character or yes. a, a real one? Okay. No, no. Um, John Dillon character. What did he do? Novel. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. Hold on. It is, uh, oh yeah. Jack Higgins. So Jack Higgins. Oh, I know the wrote, writer. Yes. Yeah. He wrote, a series about 20 about 20 books on one of the characters name is Sean Dillon right. and when after you and I spoke the other day I was my wife and I were working out the next morning and she said well when are you going because I explained that we had technical difficulties and she said when are we going to or when are you going to be interviewing him again and I said you know I told her oh I'm doing it Friday and then I said do you want to know what's so interesting and she said what I said when he talks, I can't help thinking about the character of Sean Dillon. And Even though I, there hasn't been an actor that you know of who's played him. There probably is, but I, I haven't seen. Like, I, There's no way this character has not been turned into some kind of a series. But I see what you're saying. Uh, so so the, the, the nature of the character in the Jack Higgins book uh, somehow, yes. He's uh, probably it would have benefited from my voice. Yeah. Yes. I mean, when you speak, that was the voice that I heard when he spoke. Only the difference is, and look, I'm not great with accents. He was, at, he used to be a hitman for the IRA. These books were written in the 80s. Oh, that's all right. I think that, you know, the IRA were much respected for their assassinations. And uh, I think an Irishman would have some issues with my accent, but well, um, I've had to, um, from time to time, um, adopt uh, accents uh, because of the passport I was traveling in. 
um, <clears throat> being a smuggler, um, I knew quite early on, I'd already blackened my name before I was 20. So um, I got myself a fresh passport under a, a name. And, and the way to do it in those days, children, was to um, go and look up the births and death records and look for somebody who died in infancy. So they couldn't possibly have traveled. You get a copy of that birth certificate and then fluff up everything around it. And there you are. It's not quite so easy these days, but um, but it, I, I suppose I would have had about uh, what, 25 different passports. So um, I would arrive back uh, uh, in my destination country or in any country and have to have a quick look while I was standing in line at the immigration desk to say, all right, um, uh, Jim there. Smith, uh, born on such and such. No trick questions. What's the birth sign associated with that birthday? Yeah, little things like that. Um, and um, pretty much forget them uh, after that. But it was, uh, just to give uh, your viewers an outline of um, what the smuggling operations fundamentally were, what is it? It's crossing a border and not letting the people who don't want you to cross with some illicit goods, as they see it, uh, from finding out. So how do they know or feel? You might be dodgy character. Where have you come from? How long were you there? Are you traveling alone? What's your business? Uh, and um, I grew up in Australia for I suppose, about 15 years. My accent is a, actually a very old fashioned uh, Australian accent that you don't hear anymore. But it's slightly, uh, somewhat English, of course. Were, were um, you born in Australia or just? No, I was born in London and um, it, it was. Um, I've still got some eight millimeter uh, Kodachrome from 1958 of little David learning to walk in Hyde Park and uh, nothing's working. I keep collapsing, even though I'm wearing a highly fashionable little trench coat. Uh, my father um, produced what was a very large banknote at the time and, and worth a lot more than it sounds, five pounds in, in those days. It was something like half the annual salary of a, a stevedore or something. And he was waving this in front of me, and, and I just know my instinct, even at two years old, that this is something worth grabbing for. And I'm standing up, and I finally get my little pudgy paw on the thing, and I sit down again. And you could say that for the rest of the 60 years that followed, I've been repeating those steps, <laughs> reaching out and grabbing for it. Um, but uh, I left there, um, the parents broke up, I went to. Uh, Australia, um, I did, um, I worked uh, for a television channel doing um, a kids news program when I was 12. I really enjoyed that. Although it was not, you know, back in the 60s, that was frowned upon at the high school. Yeah, you beat up the kid that, you know, had the temerity to be on television, which was a kind of uh, fade poncy kind of thing to do. So um, I carried a, a large knife under my uh, jacket uh, at, at school. I don't know what I would have done with it, but it looked pretty damn impressive. Um, I, I even fell in love with uh, one of my co-presenters, uh, Leslie Billing. I wonder whatever happened to her. But uh, there was an age difference. And when you're 12 and the girl is 17, um, you know, the Matthew, there's, there's got to be difficulties, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the time the family fortunes had declined somewhat by the time I was in uh, my teenage years, and I actively sought out um, where I could make my fortunes. Now, people have to really cast their minds back to the, the late 60s and early 70s, and I don't suppose there's too many people alive who can do so. But um, the view was that uh, we would change the world. Um, it, there were, was that revolutionary times, perhaps in the mind, uh, not in reality. Uh, people think of uh, uh, hippies and protests and anti-Vietnam War era marches. But um, in, in general society, um, protesting against uh, the Vietnam War was considered um, virtually being a traitor. The long hairs were just dirty scum. Nonetheless, 
<clears throat> we thought we'd be the inheritors of, of, uh, of the world when we grew up. So as far as drug law was concerned, <laughs> look, it's, it's your mind, your body should be entitled to do what you want. Or was that just an excuse to get in there and make some dirty money? Hard to say when you're that age. But I... Uh, Can't you do that. both? Um, well, we tried to. Look, we didn't charge an awful lot extra. When we got Thai sticks, they're kind of marijuana stick. And we had a little grocery store and we could buy tomatoes, which were a bit shriveled looking. Or under the counter, you could get uh, wads of these Thai sticks. And we, we only put, I think, about 25 cents on... On the, on the stick, so it wasn't, you know, there was some effort to be a, a little bit noble amongst the shabbiness. But um, I ended up, I got a job for a while as assistant manager at a, a cinema, a peculiar place. It, uh, it was underground, literally, in the sense that it, it was below a huge building, and it had kids' movies on during the day and softcore porn uh, at night. So there was a, well, you could say, a difficult transition between <laughs> the audiences and dads would come down and say, David, listen, uh, well, I don't know my name at that stage, but could you look after uh, the Rugrats for a while? I'm just going to go down the pub and get blind drunk. Um, look, that's like two jobs. I'd have to tell them I don't get paid for two jobs and leave the silence in the air there. So I'd have to look after these little buggers uh, and, until they got collected and then the um, dirty old men would come down uh, actually not many of them a very peculiar spread of an audience there and then the porn was nothing particularly wild you know? I mean the, the names were catchy school girl report number 64 or something uh, often from Germany um, <laughs> uh, right so um, the point to that story is that um, some of the girls who worked there uh, had boyfriends who were, as they described them, gamblers, and uh, they would uh, run downstairs and disappear out the, uh, the back door and police would follow them. A cut to the chase here, uh, the connection led to a bunch of retired safe crackers, or almost retired, and what they wanted to um, do something with their money and um, selling a lot of weed would be good, some hashish. I put my hand up, went to India, had no real connections. I had uh, one of the old bank robbers was, uh, had escaped there, pretending to be a Hare Krishna, and, and I had him. Um, and you know what? It was um, Greg Roberts, David, he, another David. He uh, went on to uh, write a book called Shantaram. If, uh, but by the time I got to the uh, ashram um, with the Krishnas, he'd bolted into something else. So I was back on the street getting the shoeshine boys to try and find me connections. I eventually found them. I went back, uh, and all the old uh, safe crackers were kind of surprised to see that I'd got through with this. I mean, it was a, Matthew, I have to tell you, it was the worst smuggling job. I had some fancy kind of complex plan where I'd taken in some uh, electronic equipment and put lead in it, chuck the lead out, put the dope in there. Uh, all that fell to pieces. I ended up taking a like, very ancient 1950s Grundig radio, gutting the thing completely, stuffing six kilos of uh, uh, Nepalese hash in there, uh, and just ooh, ooh, landing back at Sydney. Um, How old were you? Uh, I would have been 19 years old. Yeah. Um, the, the, there was a single customs officer on duty and he just took pity on me he knew perfectly well I was loaded up to the gills but he just said look are you going back there and no 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 I said I went alright see that you don't you can take your well we'll call it a radio shall we <laughs> and get going so I thought I was tip top number one smuggler but the surprising thing was all these old villains uh when they took a look at that and saw that something was actually going to happen, um, they said, well, why didn't you bring Coke or Smack? We could have all been rich. I'm scratching my head then because they, they made big speeches about how, you know, how the drugs were a bad thing, got people into trouble. But you won't be shocked 
William Matthew, that when it comes to money, <laughs> um, so certain stated principles get put aside there, don't they? Oh, yeah. Mm. Very quickly. Next thing, um, I've, I was I worked at a um, youth, getting multiple passports. I could um, travel completely. Now, remember, there's quite a large profit. I mean, you could say five times what there is on um, smuggling by air than, than there is these days. So it was still um, economically sensible to uh, leave on one pass passport, travel to a, a safe country, say the UK, as it was then, um, or, or France, um, switch passports, go back into Asia, load up, come back, switch again, go back. And so when I landed at Sydney the second time, um, I would only show that passport um, that hadn't been tainted by any Asian stamps on it. So I'd get waved through. And it took, after the early successes, um, and a success is not being arrested, isn't it? <laughs> I um, had this little luxury of uh, looking into it more carefully. Um, all right, let me ask you this. Let's say you're a smuggler. Mm. You uh, arrive back in uh, Miami. Oh, well, okay, why not? <laughs> uh, and you find yourself before two officials, customs officers, your bag's on the table, and they ask you to unlock it if it's locked. And then one starts to look through your stuff and the other one's talking to you. What would you say is going on? What What's your function at that moment? Oh, I mean, you're obviously you're concerned. It, it'd be hard to even hold a conversation. You know, yes, your, okay, your concern okay. is he's looking through my stuff. What's he going to come across? And you're trying to maintain a conversation and pay attention to the conversation. Like that's right. Well, um, this is what's almost certainly happening um, between them. After all, they're, they're in this sense, uh, your opposition, your enemy. The one looking through your stuff, he can't, he hasn't got the time to go through every object. Um, the one that is looking on uh, with whom you're having the conversation he you could call him the spotter why is that because the one who uh, lifted the lid of your suitcase and then dropped it onto his hand to feel the weight of the lid to see whether there was something packed in there he is just the handler you'll notice he picks up objects one at a time your, your toiletry bag your, your jumper a couple of pairs of trainers and puts them to the side on the, the empty lid that he's just dropped out. He'll, he'll pick them up and sort of half sniff at them or something like that, but what, he hasn't got time for anything. What the guy behind who's doing, who's listening to you babble on about uh, some hotel difficulties you had down in Guadalajara or wherever you come from, um, uh, he is looking for some change in mood in you because your eyes, and you should have been warned about this, I certainly would have, Matthew, I would have been, do not look down at your stuff. Uh, very tempting because you know the teddy bear is groaning with it. Teddy's in misshapen, he's got a swollen head, his stubby little fingers are all fat with goods. So when, um, the checker is lifted up teddy bear, given a little squeeze, that's okay, and puts it to one side. Do you know what the man uh, that you're talking to does? He notices that your attitude changes. Thank fuck you've said to yourself, Teddy's over on the safe side. It's been dealt with. I'm through, I've made it. Oh, Marianne, I mean, she was so worried about this trip and, and her dad and everything half knew what was happening. But what you might not have seen is a little tap on the shoulder. The guy is watching you because instead of babbling on uh, uh, about your hotel and making no sense, suddenly the conversation's changed. Your shoulders have dropped. They're more relaxed. Uh, you, you're just, yeah, okay. Uh, if I missed anything here, you might say, to the, you know, a complete change of attitude. And the tap on the shoulder is the last thing you touch. That's it. 
And so the whole thing freezes. And they say, let's close the case for the moment and go to the back room. And as you know, the back room is not a place you want to go to <laughs> because there's only one way out of that room and uh, it's in handcuffs. So um, this is the kind of um, thing that I, that I came to learn and a whole bunch of other stuff. And my then wife at the time, uh, clearly uh, <clears throat> she was the, um, the daughter of an Italian restaurateur. Um, she didn't want me um, doing it all myself, but I, you know, I, I kind of felt, you know, this is risky. I don't, if somebody's going to do it, at least I can only blame myself. But soon enough, there were um, probably eight or nine uh, couriers. And I'd worry about them and I'd travel with them and um, I didn't want them to, you know, they'd ask me what it was they were carrying. I'd say, look, think of the worst thing you can imagine, powdered babies you know, or plutonium. Uh, you know, just forget about what it is. You'll never see it anyway. So uh, that, that's not your function. Um, um, so that was a different kind of thing to do. Um, now, while this was going on, uh, it's not worth saying why, but there, um, I'd come to the attention of police, one of the couriers she dropped off and decided to blab. Um, they hadn't rushed in, they, they started watching me, and it was quite a big operation. I probably, I mean, and lawyer told me to get out of Dodge City to leave, just dump everything. And I, and I did at first. I, when I uh, found that they were out there, and this is now uh, by the late 70s, um, you, it was easier to intercept their radio traffic, so uh, I could hear them talking about the cars I was driving. I did get out of town, I, I took Clelia, we switched uh, identities. Um, actually went to um, uh, Miami because um, we went on to the Bahamas and uh, hired a boat for the day and went out to, uh, I said to the little skipper, take me to an island with just a sandbank really, something where there's no people and never have been. What's going on YouTube? RDAP Dan here, Federal Prison Time Consulting. Hope you guys are all having a great day. If you're seeing and hearing this right now, that means you're watching Matt Cox on Inside True Crime. At the end of Matt's video, there will be a link in the description where you can book a free consultation with yours truly, RDAP Dan, where we can discuss things that could potentially mitigate your circumstances to receive the best possible outcome at sentencing or even after you started your prison sentence. Prior to sentencing, we can focus on things like your personal narrative, your character reference letters, prepping you properly for the pre-sentence interview, which is going to determine a lot of what type of sentence you receive. If you've already been sentenced, we can also focus on the residential drug abuse program, how you can knock off one year off of your sentence. Also, we have the First Step Act where you can earn FSA credits while serving your sentence. For every 30 days that you program through the FSA, you can actually knock an additional 15 days off per month. These are huge benefits, and the only way you're going to find out more is by clicking on the link, booking your free consultation today. All right, guys, see you soon at the end of the video. Peace. I'm out of here. Back to you, Matt. And I swam out to that island with my towel in a plastic bag and then sat there for a while thinking, all right, quit now, go, or go back and take it on. Now, at that age, early 20s, uh, the Speaking for myself, the arrogance is monumental. You, you think that uh, it's not a matter of whether they've got the right to do it, that you can beat them. Mm -hmm. So so I went back and um, uh, yet, you know, there's something, so, um, even my lawyer did say this. He said, David, how long have they been following you around over a year? What do you think they've spent? Well, they've got their own offices. They don't trust the local cops. They rented them. So they spent a lot of money. So at the end of it, if they don't find anything or they run in and they and go to your house, your office, everything like that, they, they still get nothing. You think they're going to call it a day, go back to their boss and say, boss, we just spent $2 million, but uh, looks like he's quit. No, they'll do something. I dismissed all of that. You know, I thought, look, the couriers won't talk. Uh, why would they? You know, I always took care of them. I, that was the thing to say, if something happens, um, oh, you've got a choice. You can do the time and you get rewarded, 
or you know, get you the best deal you can possibly get. I'll even give you a cover story so you can look like you're, you know, ratting out the big boss. You know, it'll be, you know, we'll make some fictional character for you to talk about. Or plan B, I'll get you out, and that's it. And I kind of look forward to that, the idea that um, uh, if such a thing happened, you know, would it be possible to, to break them out? Um, I didn't imagine that this is something I'd be asking for myself, um, given time. Um, but uh, sure enough, it was. Um, it became very, very elaborate to dump the tails behind me, following me around to, to give them an explanation of where I was. I had a, a business partner, Michael uh, Sullivan, um, died a few years ago, quite a few years ago, 2001. <clears throat> I had him, now, as you think of this, um, your phone, is, you know your phone's tapped. What's best to do about that? Well, you know you've got a pipeline straight to your opposition. So whenever you feed them down that pipeline, huh, they should accept it. So I recorded a conversation with Michael when I uh, left for Asia. Um, uh, I said, go to a pay phone, ring my mobile phone, uh, my cell phone, and play this tape over it. And he did, and they were absolutely convinced that I was still somewhere roaming around Melbourne, but just laying low. So when they got a call from the USDA uh, that uh, it um, <clears throat> that I'd been located in Thailand, uh, they were kind of shocked. But I really jumped ahead in the timeline here because the, the case where the police were following me about, the, the big case, and we go back to 1980, they did steam in. They found nothing, there were no drugs, and they ran a huge case um, with uh, a conspiracy. Now, uh, the US uh, courts have got conspiracy cases, and I guess you, you know quite a few things about them. Would you agree that um, conspiracy case is much harder to win than the substantive case, uh, the case where if you've been accused of uh, that you robbed a bank on this day, uh, that's substantive, and it, were you there, have you got an alibi, all of that. But a conspiracy, that you plan to do this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you or know you you're going to get the same sentence. Yeah, Or you helped the person do this. Exactly, you were part of the conspiracy. Right, you may not or, have been the main participant, you were just you, the guy answering the phones, or... Picked them right, up. Or, or you supplied some cars, uh, or uh, you were the lookout even. Um, lots of stuff. And what's the proof in a conspiracy? Scuttlebutt gossip, just nonsense from some rat that's uh, turned over uh, on the case and done the best deal. I, I've got to say that we were always a bit, um, uh, well, kind of nervous about doing business in the US. It seemed a couple of contacts I had there said, uh, look, people here are very much encouraged to make a deal. If they're in on the, if the arrest starts to nibble away at the edges, uh, you might find you've got a, an informer uh, amongst you. Uh, and like he might've been caught with something else and uh, that's the deal to get him off. I mean. Is that that's still very common, is it? The law is, especially the federal law, is extremely lenient on people that cooperate. It's geared toward cooperation. You get a, an extreme uh, I don't know, a reward or you know a reduction in your sentence if you cooperate. And the difference could be half. It could be 75%. Mm. It's massive. And... You know, you get three people on the stand that say you were involved. You were involved. You're, you're probably. <laughs> exactly. You're probably, it doesn't matter much what you do with uh, the, the character assassination of that. person. In this right. big trial I'm talking about, uh, it was already grim because because we wouldn't talk. And not Michael, not I, not, uh, not our wives, not uh, 
No, clearly I'm not Michael's Colombian wife, Marion. <clears throat> oh, and all of the couriers wouldn't say a word. Uh, we don't know. Uh, wouldn't advise not to talk. They uh, cranked it up. They arrested not just the guys, but they arrested the wives. Even arrested my mother at one stage. That she got released, of course, the next day or before that. Um, and uh, then couldn't get bail for for the wives. Uh, and they were in uh, the old women's prison in Melbourne, and uh, they put an informer in with him, uh, Danielle. Unfortunately, she <clears throat> was an arsonist. That was her thing, little Danielle. And as a protest in there, uh, set fire to the place. Um, and now, uh, Michael and I are locked up in there. And, and uh, now they didn't have televisions, she didn't have portable radios. I think there was a a loudspeaker that went through the, the creaky old cells uh, at night. And you could hear, <clears throat> I think, the, the last news bulletin around 11 before they shut it off. And the story was about uh, um, a fire at the women's prison and that uh, some had been hospitalized. Uh, might have been. And the last thing I heard before they shut it off was the and there'd been three fatalities. So after a restful night's sleep, <laughs> you can imagine it was not, uh, I tore out when they opened up the next morning um, and went straight over to uh, the desk and spoke to the officer there. And I have, I've been there a few weeks, I sort of have knew him. I said, all right, so what is it? Was it any of them? Because they knew the girls were in there. And he started shuffling around. Um, Dave, uh, look, we haven't got everything in. And I started to fade off then. You know, when you know somebody doesn't want to tell you something mm -hmm. because uh, it's not going to be good. Um, no one had talked to Michael or I, either of us. So um, they... They, they kind of put us in a holding yard, a little thing where nobody else could go to. Then we got called up for a visit. The visit center was empty. We walked through, the, the officer was at his little desk in the, in the visit room, didn't want to look up, uh, just over that way. I walked around and uh, I could see all of my family there and uh, Clayley's brother. Um, <clears throat> and the girls were dead. Um, and your your wife and Michael's yeah, wife. My wife and Michael's wife. Yeah, and the and the, <clears throat> the little arsonist as well. Um, the the old dormitory that they were in was made of wood. It was covered in iron bars. Uh, the um, prison officer says so they couldn't get in there. Uh, the flames had got carried away. Mm. Um, <clears throat> now I kind of zoned out again in a different way. Um, you know, of course, raging and crying and uh, wanting to destroy the world. But uh, by the time my lawyer came in a few days later, um, <clears throat> I didn't want to know about in damn court or trial or who was what. Or and he was saying, "Be careful, David. You know the police are putting it around that you, you and Michael arranged that fire. That you're going to kill all the witnesses. So the, the couriers they've held up, but they're starting to crumble." Boy, the police are dirty, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, it was lucky I had the kind of lawyer that you need in a situation like this. I just passed him a note with a piece of paper on, uh, and a couple of numbers. I said, this guy will give you $250,000. Uh, call uh, my old friend Danny Mack and tell him that I'll, next time we've got a court hearing, I'll tell the police I want to spill i want to talk and they'll lead me across the road you know, the public road from the courtroom to the headquarters uh, i want the truck to come past and to be thrown these weapons <laughs> I, I was gonna go uh well i was gonna go full apache <laughs> that, that, that was my feeling at the time i, I just, just didn't care i thought you know, i played as I saw it, nice guy for all those years. And then, um, so what, what could best happen then? Oh, 
Michael and I were thrown in the Supermax prison. It was a disgusting, horrible place, which was newly built, but um, completely closed airspace, uh, faulty air conditioning, whining every night. Doors were big, thick steel things that opened pneumatically, two inch uh, bullet resistant glass, and it only held 50. But this little Supermax complex, uh, about 25 inmates would die a year in the place. And it took two years before the trial came out. Uh, the so dead, you've got so you've got a twenty five percent chance, yeah, yeah, of dying into if if they're losing fifty percent of the inmates a year, yeah, and it's two know, years that's twenty five percent. Jeez. And the staff sure. were uh, all off their heads. And one of the officers ran into the staff room uh, and and shot half a dozen. Of course, he was using blanks, but they didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, he went up and up. So, uh, oh, and, and that gave an excuse to run the trial on a high security footing uh, because, uh, um, you know, there were dead around, there were threats made, all of that. Um, we were taken to court in, I know it's customary in, in US appearances to have um, leg irons and manacles and handcuffs and things, but these were <clears throat> extra heavy ones and we'd be chained up. Um, and a helicopter used to take us in for the hearings. But just to make it interesting, <laughs> um, a week before the big drug trial uh, started, um, oh yeah, I, that's right. <laughs> this is the way of these things. I managed to get out of that supermax after a year. It's starting to, you know, it was dangerous and to wear everybody else. Got back and over to a plate place in the prison where they made number plates. Uh, these big old, you know, I know it's traditional, but they actually made number plates and they, and they used to call the big presses the never get out machines. Because when the press came down and knocked out the number plate, it made a kind of clunker clunker sound like, never get out, never get out, never get out. <laughs> yeah. And I, in a kind of way, uh, I mean, it was therapeutic. There were a lot of other people around. Uh, Michael and I couldn't think about the misery of losing wives, confiscation orders were just coming in. Police had moved into my house, um, had parties all the time. Um, there were no oil paintings. They burnt those in the fireplace, smashed up everything else, shit in the pool. The neighbors complained. The regular patrol cops had to come in a couple of times to get their parties down because they were just trashing everything. Um, then <laughs> they um, tell them, Michael and I, we've, we've got a couple of escape plans going in, in uh, over in the number plate section, but one that we actually weren't <clears throat> thinking of doing flared up. Uh, we were descended upon within the prison and taken back to the supermax with the guards kicking us all the way over there, saying things like, what, shoot at us from the towers, uh, from the helicopters, into the into the towers with machine guns, you bastard! And Michael and I are thinking, what? <laughs> Some. I met a guy called Lord Tony Moynihan, Tony Moynihan in the Philippines some years before. He was um, a, a fraudster from the UK and a lord of the realm, a peer, as they say. He a couple of swindles went tits up, and he ended up living in the Philippines. Did they ever try to get him back? No, it seems not. He liked to think him, of himself as a kind of a stringer for the security services, the, the British equivalent of the CIA. Well, he certainly was a dirty double-crosser, and he'd sent over somebody to pretend to be getting us out by helicopter, uh, but actually hoping just to um, uh, run off with uh, any money advanced on that. But uh, he not only sent this sucker over here to pretend to be a, a former you know, Greenberry special services guy, he called his um, federal police friends in Australia at the same time. He said, look, this guy's coming over. You can watch him. He'll be in hotels. He'll be doing this. Uh, he's going there to get them out by helicopter. Well, he's not really, you know what I mean, but uh, it'll look that way. So uh, I'm... Back in um, well, so the what was the max. well? I'm sorry. What was the benefit? Oh, if that he because was, it, if he was hoping to set you guys up and, and get some advanced some of the the money in advance, 
What was the benefit in telling the authorities this is what's happening? Did he uh, until he right. already got the money? Um, the once they if they um, it was two hundred and fifty thousand. Um, if that money had been advanced, um, then um, he uh, the guy who uh, sent over would um, take some of it, but he, the, his lordship would make sure he got uh, the, the sizable chunk of it. Uh, had something worked out how it had to go to the Philippines first and all of that. But by ratting everybody out on the scheme, <clears throat> he had um, fulfilled his uh, rats contract to keep him safe from extradition and everything with the authorities. Oh, That's okay. number one. And number two, uh, if he just stole the money uh, and we were intact going to a case that we might win, because there were no drugs found or anything, right. we might not take such a, a fond view of being swindled at our time of uh, weakness and might want to have a few words with him, take him fishing or something like that, have a chat. Right. Um, so the best way to deal with that was make the case you know, very hard to win. And so the headline in the paper of day one of the trial was um, smugglers escape uh, helicopter escape plan that was across the tabloids in uh, the morning of it. Even the judge pretending that he, he didn't notice that that was the right. headline. And we're being dragged in in chains, and there's, there is helicopters, but it's the police helicopter taking us to court. I won't go into it, Matthew. A court case is a boring and miserable uh, thing, but uh, it ran for six months, 119 witnesses, there were 6,000 pages of uh, transcript of... Uh, <laughs> Um, bugs wow. and recordings and stuff like that. The careers had all turned uh, state's witness. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, very hard to break down because he he admitted he was a complete scumbag and had done the deal just to get out of trouble. And he'd also told the cops, look, I'm under threat here. You'll have to guard me until the trial's over. And he continued his street trading with this uh, police escort. Uh, a couple of people got back to me and said, you know, that rat Peter Howard is, is down there on the street dealing away like mad, setting up shop in one of the cafes. And we keep spotting these cops looking after him. And people are running away, and Peter saying, Oh, don't worry about them. Ha! No, no, no. They're here to make sure that I can do what I damn well want. Right. And in a, when somebody's indemnified, anything they say can never be held against them. So Peter not only said that he'd built uh, smuggling devices for me. Um, and he knew all about it, uh, but he also um, admitted to uh, five or six different accounts of uh, theft and a couple of drug deals that were hanging over his head. So he could never be brought to trial for any of those things because he'd said it, uh, this, said this while he was um, under complete immunity from prosecution. And no matter how the worse we made him look, the, the more credible his story was. Anyway, the jury went out. They were a little bit on our side because they felt like the state had overdone it, you know, in, in our case, that um, it was, you know, serious drugs, but on the other hand, it wasn't huge amounts, you know, like two, three, five kilos, and, and we were drug users ourselves at the time. And I was uh, somewhat sympathetic. So they came back after a day and said to the judge, oh, we can't decide. Well, he's not about to blow $5 million worth of trial on that. So he sent them back out. And they stayed out. The only thing they asked for was, uh, oh, yeah, they got 60000 cash out of my office. They wanted to have a play with that. And, oh, yeah, there were some drugs in the case. The police, because they were not, went all the way to Thailand, brought back two kilos of heroin, set it up on a little stand in the court as an example of what heroin, when brought from over that part of the world, looks like. <laughs> oh, that's... that's <laughs> and, and we... this There was a whole operation to stage this little uh, platform of the steaming pile of heroin. <laughs> but it had been brought... And, and when... Uh, of course, I had my lawyer always really probe deeply on the mechanics of how they brought this stuff in and what the license looked like and who was involved, but the judge, he was on to me about that. And it was the same with the recording things. I was asking about where was the recording center for tap phones and what equipment did they use and 
you know, how many people man the station, what was its location. He, he knew that I was just fishing around to try and get um, information for the letter. Um, <clears throat> So the jury were out for um, five, six, six days, and then they came back. Do they have a verdict? Not at all. They don't want to work Sundays. Oh, no. They want to go on a picnic. And they even had a list of all the food they wanted on the picnic. So a bus was organized for them, and they went off on their Sunday picnic. And the judge is gritting his teeth through all of this, but he knows he's got to go along with it because he can't upset the jury. Um, They'd even ask for that um, two kilos of heroin, to, and they're allowed to examine any uh, physical um, bit of uh, exhibit. And the judge kind of very delicately said, um, well, it, 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 uh, it was there, but we had to take it away because they complained about it being in court. But um, what is it you want? I mean, you're entitled to, but it is two kilos of heroin. <laughs> I must mean one of my own kind on the jury, I think. Anyway, uh, who knows what? I was going to do. Um, uh, I had heard that there, there might have been a friend on that jury. I finally came back and read out the verdicts not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, but just one, one count out of the 12 uh, I went down on. That was enough for the judge. He gave me uh, uh, effectively 15 years for that. <clears throat> so back wow. to high security I went, and uh, it was a kind of a took me a while to pick myself up from that, from the Supermax. I was in that the horrible, uh, I mean, the, you know what these cells look like. It's all concrete. The bed's concrete. The, the sink is steel. The, the air is dry and stale. And the screws are half all mad. And uh, I mean, I'm in this jumpsuit, and when you go on a visit, it's had a little padlock up the top so you couldn't unzip it and hide anything. And the, um, it... it Nothing. All of all my previous life had been taken, gone. <clears throat> oh, everything, every stitch of clothing, every, every object, every uh, photograph, every letter, nothing. All trashed by the police or, or confiscated. My wife dead, gone. The only thing I had was some old cassette tapes uh, from the, the, the bug that was planted in the house, and I could hear my wife Clelia walking around the house uh, and with, her, with our dog. And a phone call had come in. It was her sister. And she said, uh, Clay, are you all right? You sound upset. You've been crying. Oh, a little. Oh, yeah. Uh, and this was back when I was still uh, up to mischief and we were still okay. There was nothing wrong that I knew of. And uh, her sister said, is it David? Has he done something? No, 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 nothing. Nothing to do with that. And the conversation ended, but it stayed with me, I can tell you, for 45 years, because I'll never know the answer to that, mm. uh, never. Anyway, um, so I, I'd been released, and um, they were right on me. As I mean, they even came to visit me before I got released and said, we'll be on your case. And sure enough, they were, so I decided to leave uh, Australia for good. Forget about well, Australia. Forget well, you to got... To the UK. You said you, you received 15 years. Yeah, yeah. I served uh, 10, or actually about 11 years. Uh, I got it for the great helicopter escape that was a load of bullshit. Uh, I got an extra year for that. Um, so I was, the, the, the way it works in, uh, the, under English law, and that includes Canada, Australia, and um, you do about two thirds of a sentence, then, then you're released on parole. Okay, so how much time did you actually do inside in the this prison? That's what I mean. It came to 11 years. 11? You did 11 years in prison? Yeah, yeah. But I worked my way to um, uh, increasingly uh, more relaxed conditions. In fact, I, I, the last part of it was um, <clears throat> in uh, an open prison. It was an old country farmhouse. Uh, it had been used for a prisoner of war camp in 1918 or 16. And we used to find old tunnels down underneath the main main uh, residence there. And uh, <clears throat> I had a job in the cafe that um, served visitors and the staff. Uh, I'd worked in a couple of other places with uh, satisfactorily in the prison system. So the, the prison superintendent, uh, warden, chief warden, governor, as they call them there, um, he took me down to this little cafe and handed me the keys and he said, listen, 
I've heard about you, David, you're all right, but this place has got to make a profit, and I think you know what that means. So, one thing, only rule, don't let these bastards at these keys, and make sure you lock the till at night and put the cash away. Man, I wouldn't even keep it in this building. <laughs> so that was quite uh, a bit, and I, I did have to clarify. I said, well, I'm not going to let my fellow prisoners run around in here. It's really the staff canteen anyway. Huh? I'm not talking about them. Oh, fuck the prisoners. No, I'm talking about my, my staff. Don't let any of the prison officers order you to give them the keys. They, they can tell them to come and see me or tell them to fuck off or whatever you want to do, but don't let them have it. So <clears throat> this was kind of unusual, and I, I'd go into town, the local small town, and, and do shopping twice a week and, and take a car and a driver and and uh, the officers would line up for that one because they knew with me they could dart off somewhere and go and have a drink or I think, what's her name, what was her name? Um, oh, she, uh, anyway, uh, she was a kind of plump uh, married woman who uh, with her husband worked at the prison and she'd go off and have her head. Um, I got, uh, this is when I was in town supposedly shopping. But the shopping, I should tell you, was <coughs> actually a list of the things that my fellow prisoners wanted, the specialties, the the, uh, the Kalamata uh, olives or the hummus or, or whatever it might be, all the goods I needed for my little cafe, um, the head cook uh, for the, the prison, he would steal those for me. In fact, I, I cut through the paperwork on that one by uh, getting a copy of the key to the, um, uh, the storerooms. And that. So I was making a profit. The, prison was making a profit and uh, the only problems I ever got was when if I lost some of the staff and my trips into town I had the the um, um, the I had the, the prison boss on the, on the radio saying where where is she I said look you know where she is but she's getting her hair done again you go and get her and bring her back and you've been out three hours this is long enough you know uh, tell her I won't let her go out again <laughs> So it was a quite upside down world there. Um, and um, I'd you know, done all sort of prison -y kind of things. I, I made a lot of stuff in, out of uh, woodwork and carvings, little Chinese boxes and didn't things. I packed all that stuff up when I was finally released, sent it to, to uh, my friend's place. But it was on from the very beginning. The police were uh, waiting. Uh, all my little artworks and carvings, they intercepted that on the courier van that took it um, back home and smashed it all up. So the courier brought a whole lot of broken wood. I said, well, that didn't make it, did it? Uh, a bumpy ride coming over here, was it? Uh, I don't know. Look, uh, I can't say. I was told not to say anything. So these were really going to annoy me, these people. I mean, I, I got a <laughs> small apartment. And, and they'd break in there and rearrange the furniture, you know, sort of gaslight me, or, or leave uh, obscene messages on my answering service. So I, I, I ended up with a girlfriend, and they pulled her aside and said, "Look, don't have anything to do with him. He'll uh, he'll be having you working as a career in a minute. Enough was enough." I, I decided to leave the country, and that's when I uh, was heading for Europe. I had uh, multiple passports again, and they were not easy to get when I'm being followed uh, night and day. Uh, <clears throat> I even had to kind of make a clumsy one that they'd get onto, so the real one they wouldn't find. Uh, um, it was, uh, I mean, what's it like in the US? What's the kind of little history of getting false passports? Is it Was it easy once, not so easy now? I mean, I, you know, my understanding is that at one point the uh, using the the death certificates would actually work back in the 60s, 70s. By yeah. the 80s, you know that was no longer something that was was going was working because when you die in the United States, the the mortuary, right? Like you go in to have you know where the funeral home. Yeah. Um, they get your your you know, they get your death certificate and they send it into social security so they can get a $250 rebate to help pay for the funeral. Well, that yeah. notifies social security that you are deceased. So the, um, the U S state department, which issues passports here, 
they get an updated list of all the people that have been deceased. So if you were to apply using a social security number for a deceased person, they would yeah. note they would have that that name and social security okay. number. Okay. So the way the way I did it mm. was I surveyed homeless people uh, that had never had a, a, a U.S. passport. I would then go get a driver's license in their name. You know, I would did order. They the, have, sorry, did they have a social security number? The homeless. Oh yeah, of course. Okay, you're issued one at birth. So uh, well, what I did was I would I would you know I'd survey them and say basically I would say that I was I was doing surveys to determine where the Salvation Army is going to place their next homeless facility. And I'd give them $20. I'd say, you know, it pays $20 right now. And I I made myself a little laminated (laughs) badge that I was a statistical surveyor. Right. right, And I had, I had a whole form. The form looked very legitimate and I had a, you know, the, uh, the clipboard, the whole thing. And so I would go out and I'd say, yeah, it pays $20 cash right now. And they go, Oh yeah. What do you need? Your Mm -hmm. name, date of birth, where were you born? What County? What's your mother's maiden name? Like everything I needed to, to, order their a copy of their social security card copy of their birth certificate i would register to vote in their name i would get a copy of their driving record and then i would go into a state where they'd never had a driver's license and i would i would take that i'd go get an id or a driver's license in their name then i would go apply for a passport in their name they'd never had one Mm. you know and so i would get a passport in their name in the u.s you don't have to provide fingerprints Right. The only time you're fingerprinted is if you're traveling excessively to, you know, there's a watch list of, you know, if you're going to Syria and, yeah. you know, yeah, that will do it. <laughs> they're going to fingerprint you. But mm-hmm. I would get the passports and then I could travel on them. I could go to Jamaica. I could go to Greece, to Italy, wherever I wanted to go on a passport. And, you know, you go through customs and they ask you, you show them a passport, which was issued by the State Department. My picture shows up when they when they scan it. My picture shows up on the screen. It's me. Mm. So that was how I figured out how to get around it. Um, okay, but you know, and all those are difficult steps, though. You know, most people have a hard time getting their own passport. How hard is it to get one in someone else's name? It's difficult. And look, Matthew, what what you're showing there is uh, 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 something the reverse of uh, the thing I we've all come across in the underground world and that is that uh, so many crooks are just simply lazy and they don't want to do the work yes. um uh i've been asked by um time to time uh, people say oh well who's your guy that gets uh, the passport or who's the guy that makes your uh, equipment for you know what you've got to do oh well that guy is me right and if you think you're coming in on some job that where uh, it's easy money, uh, no, no, no. Go back and fantasize and watch movies or whatever the fuck it is you do. But in the real world, if you want any kind of safety, uh, you have to do uh, work from the ground up. And right. and and clearly that 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 was the way. I mean, then you found that people are not willing to make that effort. I I find that even when you hand them the documents. <laughs> and you 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 hold their hand they still manage to to screw it up i i have a i have a buddy that used to provide people with the a, a false driver's license a false like all the false documents and right. as soon as they made a little bit of money they yeah. they would blow the next deal they would get on drugs they would mm. they would just do ridiculous things it was like you you can't be given any responsibility and yes, I, I agree. Most criminals are extremely lazy. They don't want to take that extra step. And as you say, not particularly in control. Uh, sometimes I, I used to think that um, so many people uh, I'd meet in prison were actually in a quiet way, mm, kind of glad to have um, their lives controlled in that way. And they grumbled about it and bitched and all that. But outside, they looked like completely... You know, the string had been undone on a balloon and they just run around like, you know, banging off the walls. I actually um, spoke with someone the other day. I did an interview and we were taught we that kind of came up in a way. And I've talked about this before where there are some people that do really well in prison. 
They, they mm-hmm. can't manage to even feed themselves on the outside. E- even the most general way, they can't, they can't even rent a room and, and get even, they can't apply for stu- food stamps. They can't do the most basic things on the outside, but in prison, they thrive. I don't yeah. know why that is. I, I, I don't understand. Um, well, it's if we broke down a prison population, um, we would find uh, a bunch of borderline nutcases that don't quite qualify for the uh, the nut house itself because they're actually able to wipe their ass and feed themselves. So that's enough. You, you can go to yeah. prison, you know, and drug addicts, ton of drug, drug addicts. addicts uh, yes, uh, giving. Um, the vast majority of people who can handle their intoxicants perfectly well and, and know when to draw the line, and giving us all a bad name by just <laughs> um, overindulging, uh, uh, stealing money from their friends, uh, mostly too lazy to even go out robbery, robbing places in a systematic way, just from whoever trusts them, they'll, they'll steal it. And then had the gall to go into a courtroom and say to the judge, well, it wasn't me, Your Honor. It was the dirty, rotten drug dealers who got me in all this trouble. You know, but, um, it, it's pretty grim. So the, the prison population is, I don't know, I, in the good old days, you could find 10% of people who were serious. And you'd know who they were because they wouldn't be in a rush to say hello and they had their own little worlds organized and how their cell was rigged up. And, you know, they got made the, the best of what you could out of a, a prison system. But it's barely even that now. Uh, I, <laughs> you know, some young, years ago I used to say to a young person, look, if you want to get ahead in the world, um, get yourself, uh, go to Amsterdam, break a window, or something that get you into prison for a few weeks, uh, to do something fairly decent over there. But you'll fill up your little contact book uh, with great names. Oh, yeah. Names, everybody you want. But now I'd be tempted to say, look, the bad thing about it, prisons aren't what they used to be. They're really just nut houses or, or places for wife beaters and snitches. Um, so, oh, incompetence. You just find the whole place annoying and wish you were somewhere else. So there's not one virtue left even in it. Uh, um, sorry, I have a quick question. In Australia, yeah. do you have a a federal system and a state system? It is. It's, um, it's even though all the, uh, like early America, all, all the street names and the town names are, are British, um, the, uh, when it became quasi-independent, it still has the crown as a head of state, but, and likes it that way, uh, but uh, it, each state had its own uh, Supreme Court and um, legislature, uh, a two-chamber one. Uh, and then federally, they have a Senate and a House of Representatives. So it's very similar to the, um, the, to US. the US. In fact, if it wasn't for... Um, I think the similarities between Australia and the US are, uh, are very, very strong, um, except that the US is more mature in the sense it's older, and so you've got quite big state difference in um if you go down south people are quite different than there even east coast west coast there's a sort of a, a, a different outlook uh, somebody much. said to me years ago in the um in the protest movement uh, there was a uh, abby hoffman was going to um uh, surround the uh, pentagon and they were, all the hippies were going to hold hands and levitate the pentagon into the air <laughs> Uh, now, the East Coast people thought that'll be a great media moment. It'll look good. They can stage this and that. And, you know, the, the, it'll move the cause ahead. Whereas the West Coast Californians, hippies, thought, yeah, the Pentagon's really going to get into the air with all this, you know, positive energy going on there. So uh, quite a lot flakier uh, they did. Um, so there, there was this. And, and this some, I suppose if we have some time in the future, we could probably uh, uh, compare um, what um, what the style and the manner of different places uh, is like in the US. We when in the early days, it used to be a thing to go to a, um, a country or a place you didn't know, and then score. 
it didn't really matter what you scored, but the important thing was you had no contacts and you had to go out there and do it. And it was quite a good thing. You got to know, you know, the, the, the underbelly of, of, the, of a town quite quickly. Uh, and I certainly found um, Los Angeles a lot more weird um, than New York, uh, which was very businesslike in, in its um, own messed up way. Yeah, I was going to say the, in the so the in the federal system here, you know, you have more, not not a whole bunch more, but you have more serious criminals in the federal system. It, I as guess you to, would, you know, yeah. In, in the state system, you have you know you have rapists, you have uh, burglars, you have guys that have you know stuck up convenience stores, stolen purses, stolen cars. <laughs> like, these, these you know, yeah, the they're real dregs of the criminal world, right? right. Yeah, yeah the, in the federal system, you have you know guys that ran a Ponzi scheme. You have you know a lot of mm. not a lot, but a substantial amount in comparison to the states. Uh, white collar criminals or even the drug dealers yeah. in the federal system have done things much more sophisticated. You have, you have smugglers, you have people that manufactured methamphetamine, like they set up a lab somewhere or right. as yeah. opposed to in the state, that's not the state you have. If you're a drug dealer, you were selling drugs on the corner right. you know, in the fed. You were, no, we were, we were bringing them in from Mexico or right. you know, from, from but, Thailand or, doesn't it um i got the impression that um doing time in the federal system was much more rigid and, and in some ways harder to work in any angles on it you know get to they're uh, much better it, conditions it, and things well so in the federal system you, you you have better conditions like the the buildings are nicer there's air conditioning right. you have but but you also have um they're very strict they're very strict mm -hmm. on the on the inmates. You know, you have dress codes, and you have you know your you have stand up count, and you're you know polite, and you're uh, it's it's very you know there's a there's a regiment to it, and you know you're not going to have conjugal visits, you're not going to have contact visits. You're you only get really? very few. Oh, it's it's you very few visits. You have very limited time on the phone. You have it's you do and you do a ton of time. The same type mm. of crime in the state you might get a year for or two you'll get 10 years in the federal system wow. 20 yeah. they don't care they they and you do 85 percent of your time no matter Good what God. i mean that's that's uh, i suppose you would have i would have thought as an outsider that looking at the um because it's federal they could have been a bit more sensible about it because they have fewer people to answer to and they haven't got you know the the complexities of um, state uh, systems of uh, local mayors and um, councillors, all the little things that get in the way. But I would have thought that a federal one, they could have said, look, it doesn't make sense to lock up people forever. And we need uh, to ha advance people through to a, a, a working outside open prison system as quickly as they, they can manage. So you would that, think... You think, <laughs> but that's not the way. Yeah, it's still they're still behind all of it. It's still politicians. You know, it's really? still politicians, and it th then the nobody gets elected by saying, "Hey, let's you know some of these guys. You know, let's let's slowly acclimate them back into society. Let's educate them. Let's mm -hmm. even though all the all the numbers, all the statistics say, the better education you have, the less likely you are to commit crime. Doesn't matter. Uh, the the more you educate prisoners while they're incarcerated, uh, the the better chance they have of not coming back to prison. Doesn't of matter. Course. Of course. You know, the more you monitor them on the outside, you know, if you give them a ten year mm. probationary uh, sentence, or mm. put them on an ankle monitor and let them have a job, they have a mm. less chance of coming back to prison. Doesn't matter. Like they get elected by saying, "Lock them up and throw away the key." Right. Um, it's um, it, it is really hard to change that when the when the politics of it come in. I spent a little time in um, a Danish prison. The law there, when they set up the prisons department and the, the sort of justice system, they made it so it was utterly independent from politics. That they would be the only way to do it, and and their own their own kind of constitution within that system. So 
it doesn't matter what the politician comes and says. Politician doesn't have to sign off on anything. There's no governor to sign off on. The prison service decide, and they um, also part of their charter is that they are obliged to send you out better than you came in, and if they fail in that, um, they then have to provide. They write you off. If you've served more than six years, they expect that you've probably, um, this is served more than six years in, in uh, a closed prison, um, you're probably not going to very well adapt to the real world again. So 90% of inmates, are, if sentenced to anything, are, are in open prisons. And they can serve their time at weekends if they've got a job. They don't want them to lose their job. Um, and the sentences are generally a lot less. And even in the closed prisons, um, sections have no more than 25 inmates and they have big kitchens and you're paid enough to go to the local supermarket within the prison. You have to do your own shopping. You have to work. You have to be as normal as possible. You know, things are not handed out like toilet paper and razor blades. If you, you know, if you're, um, and, and, and people generally don't come back unless they're in a particular kind of group of people that have decided to be criminals their whole life. Right. Um, and it, just by the way, in that country, it's um, two motorcycle gangs, Hell's Angels and the Banditos. And they are the most serious uh, criminals to get as an organized form there. Um, I'm not too sure whether they ride too many bikes anymore, but they certainly get up to a bit of mischief here and there. Um, and it's... Um, uh, and yet in the UK, it would never, to have suddenly impose an open prison estate, you could say, uh, on the prison service here, it would be a disaster. Uh, people are so, um, us and them against, uh, you know, fuck the world and uh, uh, society owes me everything, I'm going to destroy it. They, they really, and I think that's partly population. And when you got, um, you know, we have these big countries with big populations, whereas the Scandinavian ones have little populations. And there's more of a sense of community there, so they don't feel like they want to destroy everything. Um, so very hard to bring it. I mean, can you imagine if you tried to have, you said to, um, I don't know, even 75% of the inmates, oh, listen, you're all going off to an open prison, and those of you who are not violent, you actually be reporting weekends. and um, That would be fine, but um, for for most inmates who are used to closed conditions, um, and they went to a, their new prison, which was like some kind of a motel, they just run off and get drunk. Yeah, they wouldn't know what to do. They they, you, I, I was going to say most of the inmates, if every time they would give us some kind of benefit, some mm -hmm. kind of new program, the inmates ruined it. They oh, always yeah. ruined it. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah no, fuck that. Uh, um, I was mm. going to say, what, uh, so what happened when you went to, you finally moved out of, they, they, it sounds to me like they basically made your life so miserable. You just said, I'm, I'm, you, they ran you out of, uh, Australia. You're right. Said, I'm I, I thought I, I, um, at least learned that much that, um, you can't fight and win. So, uh, that was it. I got a couple of good passports, um, very elaborately, you know, having to hide all the, mechanisms for that from them and, and to say got away clean and uh, i stopped though in bangkok to pick up some money because it'd been years i'd lost everything i had a, uh, a thai business partner there who had some money for me but um i also uh, made a phone call to um a guy i knew from chiang mai it was thai but he was very careless and um but I didn't know at the time that his uncle was um, huge. Uh, you know, they talk about the Golden Triangle. It had like three main groups and all of that. Well, there's uh, four, and this this uncle was in one of them. His was the um, the White Horse brand on the on the stamps from the laboratories. I knew nothing about that, or worse, that um, this uncle had uh, uh, arranged for the the wife of um, a DEA agent who was uh, stationed in uh, Chiang Mai at the office there. Now, in the office up there, they tell the agents not to go out like James Bond and sort of do shit and visit places and things. But this guy, 
insisted on going to see the opium farmers and, and nosing about. Well, the uncle wanted to teach him a lesson uh, by um, picking up the wife uh, on the school round and uh, letting her go, of course, but just to say, look, your job's behind a desk. You don't mm -hmm. run around with my you. farmers. Yeah. Right. Um, that went bad, and uh, the kidnapper's car broke down at an intersection, and a policeman came along, and mm -hmm. the policeman got shot, and one of the kidnappers was shot, and it left one kidnapper remaining with... Um, he let the kids go, of course, and the nanny, and just kept the wife, and he had a, a, a pistol at her head saying... And, call this, do something. There was some big monk kind of priest guy that was going to swap positions with him and get the wife out. But um, it went on for hours. And uh, what he'd done to keep himself alive was take some wire from under the broken down car and uh, the, where the dashboard was and tie it around the, the trigger of the pistol um, and keep his thumb on the hammer so that if he got shot, his grip would release and she'd die. So that was keeping him alive. Uh, if he hadn't said that, he would have been dead a long time ago. But um, this uncle, the big man, had arranged for everything to go well, for the wife to be uh, released, for nothing to be found out, and to dispose of the, the gunman. But nobody had accounted for, ah, small things make a big difference, don't they, Matthew? This was, in this case, it was a sweaty thumb on a steaming hot day. And uh, some slipped, hammer went off, bang, killed the wife. And the instructions that everybody had handed down uh, after that, um, the instructions from the Americans was, we want this guy alive, we know what's behind all this, we want him to tell us about the uncle. Um, and the instructions for the Thai commanders from the uncle, which was, <laughs> if it goes bad, kill him right um it did go bad he was killed but the point to this is that this whole background to this guy i knew nothing about ever ever had any inkling that uh, the uncle was so deeply involved that the dea were uh, the sworn enemy that um anything to do with the, that family would be in, of interest to them so his phone was tapped uh, when I, I spoke to him that was recorded. They knew I was in Thailand. When I say they, I mean the, the uh, British and Australians didn't really care so much, but the DA did as well. And uh, um, they decided to uh, uh, to arrest me there on anything. It doesn't matter in Thailand. Uh, you arrest somebody, on, it doesn't matter if there's drugs involved or not. I went to the airport uh, to get out. I could see they were all sniffing about. So I melted into the crowd, disappeared downstairs. You're in an airport to get away. You don't take the taxi from the taxi rank. You try and get a car from the middle of the ones waiting outside the airport so they can beat their way through the traffic. I did that. Took these little motorcycle taxis once I was back in, in town. Went um, had a drink in a hotel bar. Went to a shopping center. Lots of things to get rid of them. But... Um, they were tapping phones, including one to a travel agency whose office I was going to use to make some calls. In short, I arrived there. I was pounced upon, uh, arrested. I had two passports, about 55,000 US dollars on me. Um, there was a bit of a conference, I believe, and it was decided uh, uh, I should be arrested with some kind of drugs. They, every afternoon at, at the airport, they do a bit of a sweep up around the floor, especially before security, because people dump all their bits when they, they get cold feet about going on with it. Uh, so some stuff was sorted out from there, and it only takes 25 grams of, um, and say, cocaine or heroin or, or something at an upper level, even ecstasy, to have the death penalty there. So... <clears throat> Um, I, after a week, in the, uh, when it looked like I could get out of the passport and money charge, um, I, I thought I was very depressing. Um, I realized I never would, and they were charging me with uh, 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 a death penalty offense. 
Uh, well, I mean, but they didn't catch it on you. They just planted. No, it. no, no. They 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 said that um, um, we found it at the airport, and um, it, it it must have been his. What other criminals could have possibly been at the airport that day? None. No, I didn't see any criminals. No. I didn't what see was any. it? Heroin. Uh, this was heroin after a bit of decision making, because the the first bag looked like you know, cigarette butts and a bit of weed and you know a few pills of God knows what kind. Uh, but it, the heroin's is very reliable to get the death penalty. So um, that was about six. What was that? Uh, Thirty five grams or something like that, you know, an ounce or so. Um, and I'm assuming this isn't a, a long legal battle that takes a decade to fight. Oh, it does take a while because you only appear in court every six to eight weeks and you're only there for one witness or an hour or something like that, if anybody shows up on any side. Um, you're taken there in leg iron. I mean, really massive elephant chains. They, they clap the C ring around your ankle. Some guy hammers it on there um, and you... Get a shoelace or something to lift up those chains so you don't rattle too much. Um, I, um, but uh, I should point out that I'm now in what the hell was I? Thirty-five. My my late thirties. Uh, since I was eighteen, I've been battling them. I'd lost everything and then uh, gone through this prison sentence. I got out and they're chasing me around. I get to Thailand and they fuck me over. Uh, I couldn't even kill myself in, in this jail. Um, it was huge. It was disgusting. The, the, the dormitories had, um, it were built for 64 and they had 140, 150 people. You could rent a piece of cardboard to sleep on the, the floor in the corridor. The toilet was, uh, if you were lucky, it was in one of the, the, the cages, and, and so there was a hole in the ground down the end, but the, the corridor people <clears throat> had a huge 44-gallon drum with a plank over the top of it, and that was their toilet. Mm. Um, it's, uh, there just seemed no way out, and I thought, if I'm that unlucky, uh, it's a long story, I won't really detail it here, I've written about it before, but the odds seem so against me that um, what was the point of going on? So I actually wanted to escape just to kill myself. It sounds mad. I even had the hotel in mind from which I was going to jump, the Dusatani, because when you get up there, there's a little hatch that um, you, you can climb out onto. Um, there was an old guy. Uh, when we go to court in the morning, you have these chains put on, and in the uh, this huge prison, Klong Prem, sometimes called the Bangkok Hilton, but that applies to other places. Um, I had a lot of people going to court every day, and they'd be lined up. There was an old man just waiting, looking depressed on the side of the internal road inside this prison. And um, a sound truck was coming down, um, doing some repairs or some building thing. As it approached, he had the presence of mind, you could say, the determination to shove his head um, between the, the rotating tires as, as the truck passed. The two big fat tires at the back rolled over his head and it made a weird poppy sort of sound oh. that twisted his neck into a scrunched up bit of cloth or something it looked like. And uh, the guys were very annoyed at that. They had their trustees and they had a very big trusting network in this prison. Um, and they, they were ordered just to take that thing away, you know. <laughs> and they were sort of looking at us, the, the foreigners, saying, well, don't worry about it, it's Thailand, it's different here, you know. But I, I thought to myself, I have to applaud the courage of this old guy to um, just end it, you know, and end it now. But there was no... I tried to do it in the police station. This was uh, a miserable enough time. It was just three days before Christmas, and as best I could tell. If my very most intense, thoughtful efforts couldn't keep me safe, um, then it's, it's, it's just going to be torment uh, forever. So I, I might as well try and end it. I tried to get a whole lot of sleeping pills. Um, 
but that actually doesn't work terribly well. Um, the guy next to me, Swiss Freddy, he took over a hundred, <laughs> over a hundred row hypno, you know, which is a pretty strong thing, isn't it, really? Um, and he was, I, he wasn't dead, he was still breathing, but he didn't move for near on three days. Um, we, we'd poke him every so often and thought, oh, no, well, and we're just lying on mats in the, an underground cell where this little, tiny little cell barred window up the top. You, all, all that did was let in the grit and traffic fumes and the oil from the passing traffic outside. Um, and there were some Chinese guys in there, six of them busted on a big drug case, and they were deciding who'd take the fall. The younger ones, of course. Uh, they even brought me a Christmas cake. Uh, <laughs> they, they had it arranged. And my Thai friend in, in that jail said, uh, what was my name in there? Oh, I, I think he, uh, I used Mike for my, my friends in, in that place. But anyway, he said, uh, Mike, this is the best time. Whatever you can do in the police station, this is where you win, if you win. You go to jail, it's finished. I tried, but being a foreigner, they, they wouldn't touch money, they wouldn't touch anything. Um, and, and no, I, 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 was, I was kind of gone. And the cases there, you, you can't win. Um, I know of uh, a friend there, um, he'd, he'd go to court on, there were some Canadians involved in a smuggling case, and he was accused of being the um, translator for them because he spoke Thai. Uh, evidence against him? Well, there weren't any even Canadians. It was just um, some investigation that had gone bad and nobody had been arrested, but the case had been lodged by um, the Canadian equivalent of the DIA, so they wanted something done. Um, a photocopy of a grainy black and white picture of a group of people sitting at an outdoor table of a cafe somewhere included, you could just about make it out, um, John's face sitting there. And the way the court works is um, whatever the evidence of the day is, is read into a, a cassette recorder by the judge, and that's typed up, and that's the case. And the judge got this old picture and said, uh, oh, yes, evidence against the accused. Uh, it actually doesn't translate as accused there. It translates as sinner. You know, evidence against the sinner, uh, a photograph showing him translating for the drug gang. <laughs> he got 50 years. So, uh, it, it, it was not. There are a few cases, some people have won, but only when there's a bunch of them and they let a few go just to uh, make it look like they're, they're giving it some consideration as long as nobody's interested in it. So, so there was no winning the case. But uh, the jail was so awful. Um, um, and, you know, my friends were kind of burnt out. You can imagine this has gone on for years, and I had the jail, and then we followed it again, and now I'm facing a death penalty. They, um, they, just, um, they just didn't know whether they could uh, go on with it. I just have to, well, Matthew, after... Um, after it, I survived, I had no choice. There was no way of, but, um, the wife of my little friend that I'd met in the police lockup, uh, uh, she was bringing him things in, like food and so on. Uh, they were pretty good, the police. They just let you have what you want. <clears throat> you know, medicines, uh, things of comfort. And I did ask her for um, a whole lot of sleep and pills, and she kind of, uh, she was an older woman <coughs> compared to the, the young guy who was in his uh, early 30s. <coughs> and his wife was um, crowding uh, somewhere in the mid 40s. So I'm experienced enough to know when somebody says, looks sort of miserable and says, get me a fistful of the strongest sleeping pill you can find. Right. It's not just for a good night's sleep, it's for the eternal night's sleep. And so she kind of declined on that. But a few things um, uh, saved me a bit. Just to g give uh, an idea of the, the, the flavor of uh, what happened, 
Um, uh, foreigners are arrested in the foreign countries to them. Um, usually somebody from the consular services from an embassy will turn up. Well, I, I was in no hurry to see the, the British or Australians because uh, I'd actually seen them as I was being arrested. Some liaison police officers were there in, in the police station. So they'd been there before I got there. So this was well planned. Um, and a guy I recognized from the DEA, uh, old uh, Bill, um, he uh, had been in, in you know, we were speaking before about this big trial. He'd actually turned up at the, the trial to give the evidence from what the DEA knew about things in Thailand. And he was there. So, um, in fact, he would stay with me for years to come after that. Um, uh, they didn't contact me, but an, an uh, Australian liaison uh, officer came out. And it was very goading. Very, he, he visited the prison and said, "Look, you're 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 finished. Um, if they don't kill you here, you'll be doing at least twenty years after you appeal it down to a life sentence, and uh, we'll request you extradition back to Australia, and we'll hit you for something or other there. What's left of you, anyway." So he was cheery enough, and <clears throat> I said, well, I'm starting to recover a bit, you know, it doesn't necessarily always turn out like you, you want in life. No, he'd have none of it. So in a way, I was starting to get the feeling, oh, there's something worth staying alive, alive for, even just to make him eat his words, I guess. <clears throat> but from the, when my friend had said that the time in the police station is the best you get, I could sort of understand that when I went out to the court and there were like hundreds of people just swinging around because the toilets had backed up again and it was the holding cells were underground. Cacophonous noise. You, you couldn't, you have to shout just to talk to the guy next to you. And uh, the clanking chains and little industries were around, food being passed through the bars in, in tied up plastic bags and bags of warm rice, bags of. God knows what kind of food. Um, and I noticed the uh, people in the court who were wearing kind of prison uniforms and shorts and a t shirt in an off brown color, um, they were all chained up. They had these heavy chains on around their ankles. And I saw one guy dressed a little better, but still with the heaviest chains I've ever seen for an elephant. And he had a, um, a garter clip around his calves and his legs and they were holding up this, this heavy chain and they were all polished and chillingly I saw um, that where the, the C ring was just pushed together with most people they were it was somehow welded around his ankle and you couldn't help but think how the hell did uh, that happen how did he do that um, and I could see he was um, Chinese in origin, so uh, we got talking. <clears throat> he pointed out to me that when I go to the jail, if it's a, a drug case that um, uh, can result in life or death, um, you'll be wearing chains from now on until the end of your sentence. And, and, um, and why was he uh, wearing them welded together? Because he he was coming from death row and he uh, had been already sentenced to death and was trying to appeal it down. But when you're convicted of that, um, they put some kind of cloth and a, a wooden curve bit of wood um, between your, your leg and your ankle and the chain, or the link, I should say, and then they, they weld it uh, together because it's never coming off. Um, uh, and uh, I would find out later on um, how it would come off. Uh, from there, the, the court proceedings uh, seem to take seconds. You're just remanded. A big uh, iron bus drags you out from the, the, the courtroom. Guards with machine guns everywhere, looking bored and sweaty and wanting to kill just for the hell of it. Um, it's quite a... a Certainly, a, a violent town. Um, there's a, a magazine there that is kind of police gossip magazine called 9/11, and it's got 
all the grisly pictures of the latest shootouts and explosions and stuff like that, or even car accidents. Um, so that they, they're used to a fair bit of bloodshed. So you really don't, even though in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how can I get away? Is there any way to get out of this? Go to the jail, it drives, it goes to a huge complex. All I can see is walls stretching this way, walls that way, huge walls, probably, I don't know, um, they say the whole nine yards. I think the, the height of these things must have been about 12 yards high, and certainly um, much higher than it ever was. And it had um, barbed wire up the top that was tied to insulators. So that means it was electrified, and the, and the bus drove over a moat um, so that it was, uh, I don't know how far this moat went across, it was probably about 25 feet, seemed to stretch in every direction to the corners and then turn. Um, the bus bumped over some more walls and more doors, and we're all herded off. And yet, when we were finally let off the bus and sitting in a little street, there seemed relatively quiet even though it was only about 4, four o'clock, 4.15 in the afternoon. And that's because the prison day had ended. I mean, as we know, that even in the West, um, a prisoner's life is revolves around a single shift of the guards. Um, everything, there are some people who are out late uh, doing various jobs or some activity, but generally speaking, uh, the day ends early, doesn't it? and it's no different anywhere around the world. All of us are pushed off, told to get naked, squat on the floor, put our clothes in front of us, and wait for the, uh, the searches and inspections. I mentioned before that the trustee system works in extraordinary ways there. The guards are outnumbered by prisoners probably at least 500 to one. They, they walk around with a long stick for demonstration purposes and the occasional angry squat at one or two, but it's the trustees who do the, the grunt work and the grit work and the punishments. Um, a trustee will have a little uniform. Uh, still, all prisoners wear shorts, and no long pants are allowed on prisoners in a tight jail. And um, But they've, they've got <laughs> pilot's wings and insignia and lanyards and epaulets, uh, little decorations on it. Uh, and. Um, a little holster for a, a, a truncheon, and that's the trustees, and they can beat on prisoners as they see fit. Um, and their master is their particular uh, prison officer who might be in charge of something. And the guy in charge of reception of new prisoners that day was known as the Skull because of his bald head. And I give in English anything he might said because he, um, I got this translated for me. Um, so. Uh, he dealt with all uh, the people. When the, these are boys who are coming back into prison that he knew, and they'd be sent over to um, the, the barber who was standing there with a pair of electric uh, clippers and uh, some scissors. Bald head, bald head, bald head. Oh, nicked a bit, a bit of bloodshed. Never mind, patch that up. Next. Uh, I got out of that one. Uh, as I said to a couple of fellow Westerners, religious grounds, no cutting of hair. All right, no, we're, we're on to that. Uh, and I could see, and I'd been warned by the um, Chinese guy back at the, um, the court that if my case was a death sentence case, I'd have chains on all the time. So I shredded my court papers and wrote 15.2 um, G on the back of my lawyer's card. Um, and uh, <laughs> that I played the dumb foreigner when they said, oh, you've got papers. I don't know. Oh, what's your case? Uh, drugs. Oh, death, death, death. Yeah. More white trash. Yeah, more white trash coming to the prison. Um, and, and it was the beginning of being on the, the bad end of, um, you know, that they say the the privileged white men. Well, you certainly get a lesson in what it's not to be, and, the, and you're the reverse of it all. Um, so that that's how they viewed um, any uh, European uh, that came in. There, there must be just white trash and beggars and scum floating around the world. Well, they wouldn't be here. You know, they'd be protected. They'd be rich. Uh, poor people, uh, pretty much the ones who came to jail. 
So the skull is sitting in his throne that his trustees have put together. People are coming back and bald-headed. They're being sent over behind the modesty of a single towel held over a piece of string, while some guy does an anal search uh, wearing, what, rubber gloves? No, 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 that's for sissies. He had a pair of <laughs> knitted wool mittens oh. um, that uh, were pink in colour. Well, had been, but... Um, not just one of the fingers, but the, the, the forefinger and index finger were brown stained. So um, I, th um, I just wasn't going to play along with that one. Um, religious reasons, yes. Embassy, uh, don't, you don't want to get the embassy involved or get embarrassed. No, I mean, they swallow that about the embassy, but they, the embassies would be kind of useless. Um, managed to get out of that one, but when... They kept pressing about my case. Uh, I gave them this lawyer's card. Uh, lawyer, take the papers. I, I had no help, no help. And they looked, and they looked amongst each other. Oh, yes, 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 15 grams. Okay, no, you go sit there. Now, all the, really the other, the Kevin from Hawaii was with me by then. Um, he came in, and uh, he stupidly admitted to um, his case being about one kilo that had been hidden in a um, hotel room ceiling. Um, and so he was out, went over to the other bench where they, they put on these, they're waiting to have these heavy chains put on, and he, he stayed in them. People learnt um, fairly quickly some tricks about living in a pair of uh, chains that don't come off. Um, you make sure you wear light underwear or if it's boxer shorts then the thinnest pair you can get because you're going to have to thread them down one leg poke them through this thing off uh through the gap in the in the, the ankle uh, c-ring flip them over your toes back up again and down on the other foot and that way you can get them off to, to wash um oh and and all washing is uh, uh over by a, a tank in the the open ground there and the only thing they give you by way of equipment for your new prison life is a, a, a plastic bowl. And that is your uh, food bowl and washing scoop for the big tank where you take a bird bath, as they used to call it, scooping up and, and splashing yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, the skull uh, swatted a couple of people. He took a thousand baht off me that I had an envelope and said, if you were tired. I would have battered you all over the place by now for hiding that. And Thai kids had their shampoo squeezed out over newspapers, their soap bars cut in half, their, all their long trousers that they arrived from the jail cell with, they're all sheared off with a massive and rusting pair of scissors. And then we were good to go, and uh, fish head soup was served that night, but nobody felt like eating it. Squashed into a, another huge dormitory, uh, in which there's no way you can think of all these people fitting in. Uh, but there's a room leader, and he's over in the corner. He's a different kind of trustee, he's uh, wearing white shorts and um, trainers and whatnot, and he delivers his welcome speech, which my Thai friend you know, translated for me. Uh, amongst his lines were, well, hello, boys, uh, here we are. For those of you who haven't been there before, and I've seen that quite a few of you have been here before, um, you won't be in this cell forever, but uh, while you're here, see that toilet? That's for me to use, not for you to use. If you're desperate for a pee, ask one of my boys, and they might, might give you permission to go and have a pee, but don't rattle your chains. I don't want to hear it. I'm a light sleeper. And I'm an angry man when I wake up from a light sleep. And as for doing number twos, forget about it. It does not happen. So he spent about like half an hour terrorizing everybody over there. Um, and then sleeping head to toe, literally like sardines in there until, thank God, the morning came at some point and uh, uh, got out to try and make life better. But it didn't get much better in that section. It was the uh, drug remand section where... Um, um, they, in the greater prison, uh, you'd be allowed to um, carry cash around with you, but they didn't like it in, in the drug prison because they were accused of letting rampant trade go on in, in drugs. So um, 
<clears throat> they had a substitute currency. It was little um, sachets of headache remedy, tamchai, aspirin. And a very good testament to um, how to run an economy. Argentina could learn a, a thing or two of that. Uh, certainly Venezuela. They used to buy boxes of these uh, sachets, and that would each one would be worth about. And you could buy a packet of Krong Tip, the uh, local cigarettes, for 30 of them, or, or buy any other service that you might want. So um, it, it was quite hard in that section. And, um, and but, but there was really, you couldn't just, you have to be patient when trying to um, bribe your way through um, uh, these things. It, it, people always imagine those countries as, um, you know, a haven for uh, bribery. And I guess things are easier, but they don't really see it as bribery. They don't see themselves as corrupt. They, they see that they're, they're helping out uh, the odd prisoner or two, the, the lucky ones. And they very much base that on whether luck's good. So um, I, I had to get to somewhere which would be better. And that took quite a bit of doing, but the prospect for escape didn't look too good. Never heard of it. Never anybody spoke of it. But even during my time in this section, they, um, they had like three or four higher buildings stacked up. Of uh, dormitories, and underneath it was some benches where people spent during the day, um, opened up in the morning, all lined up, squatting on the ground, singing the national anthem, and then all the food systems kick into play. You could, uh, somebody um, would organize um, a shopper to go out and buy things. You, you could not eat what they called government food. It was um, just a, a, a soup and a few. Um, Oh, you were lucky if you got the fish head. I think they'd fight over that. And some oh moldy cucumber. Oh, and you had to pray over it as well. So I organized myself with uh, uh, the Chinese cooks and their woks, and they got their gas arranged. Uh, there was lots to do in that sense, but then again, nothing to do as well. Now, um, as much as I still wanted to bring about my end, um, there was an attempt from one of the dormitories, and I, I really don't know how the, 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 the street gang managed to keep control of the dormitory to stop people squealing or had the trustee under control or threatened them with death or whatever they did, but they managed to cut through the mesh of the, the edge of the, the dormitory, which is, you could say it was like a window, but it was mostly steel mesh. And that, oh, where did that take them? Well, it was remarkably like um, an escape anywhere. The five prisoners had all lied to each other about what arrangements they'd made and, and how. They probably found themselves quite surprised to be out in the internal streets of the prison. Uh, one of them said he uh, knew how to get to the out outer wall, but that wasn't quite correct. Another one said he had a rope hidden, and that definitely wasn't correct. And the, I mean, it was. We're in the 90s here, and, and there wasn't a huge amount of cell phones around, but there were some. Oh, and, and, and that wasn't happening either. So that was stuck. They uh, looked around for something to get over that wall, but they, they simply couldn't. Um, that, uh, well, they handed themselves in back to the guard. The guard that was on duty that night was sleeping there when sort of tugged him, and he was kind of surprised and thought, well, what have you been let out for? Uh, nothing, boss. We, we got out ourselves. What? <laughs> now, out of <laughs> the things you could do and get away with, you could have whiskey, you could have drugs, you could even arrange for a, a woman somewhere or something that passed for one. They had a, an entire building of a thousand with uh, Thai lady boys or uh, oh, <laughs> Thai lady uh, boys. Full of uh, AIDS, uh, VD, mm. and uh, hormones when they had the money for it. But sometimes the hormone supply would dry up, so that they look pretty hairy indeed over in the corner. Um, so there were, I mean, you could do almost anything that um, you wanted inside, but to escape something that affected the lives and livelihood of the, of the officer concerned and everybody 
and so shameful letting prisoners no no they, they wouldn't have so they got locked into um what they call the punishment streets they're not really streets the name comes from some old tradition of chaining people to the ground but it was actually a, a, a series of coat lockers uh, about half size with nothing but a little slit like a letterbox hole in the, the, the top half of it so that, that's how they would spend their, their days in there oh and chained up and just in case, they'd have um, a bottle of water and um uh, what else? A bowl of rice every day. That was it. Oh, and a paint tin. That was their toilet. But they probably lost the mood for either eating or even taking a dump. I'm pretty certain because every afternoon they'd drag some of them out and beat them with long sticks. And all the little workers on the wing and the landing on the grounds would be cleaners would be uh, shoved away somewhere. We'd all be put downstairs. And have to endure this terrible sound of uh, of them being beaten up, and it must have been quite horrendous to just hear this whacking into flesh and the kind of crunching sound as bones were cracking, um, and piteous wailing. So they were really picking the tip of the sticks and uh, aiming their targets at soft spots until the the hitting was going on people who no longer were conscious enough to even scream and it would just then be the sound of something heavy hitting a carcass of meat or something like that um very hard to tolerate uh, somebody else getting punished of course it's better than you could say better than being punished yourself but how to endure it with somebody else they didn't survive a lot of that treatment the four of them were dead within uh, um about i think three and a half four weeks it, we put it down to internal bleeding mostly the singaporean because he was foreign they didn't go too hard on him but when he finally after months got released from his coat locker he was a strange gray color and never spoke uh, mm. my time there he never spoke again so this was a section i'd have to get out of and um uh, I managed to um, bribe and finagle my way into the bigger section where there were a number of sub-prisons that um, were for sentence prisoners. And the pressure's off, there's not so many court hearings. Um, you could get organized in there, and, and, and I did with a group of them. Hmm. Now, um, my supportive friends were still pretty good, but um, people didn't really know what had happened to me. Uh, Michael was still alive and living in Australia. I eventually got um, um, the use of what, the, really the general store, they, they would rent out a phone from time to time, but for some reason the name of it was Coffee Shop, and run by Chinese ties. Of course, Chinese ties run everything in Thailand. Um, they, the government even forced them to change their names into Thai-sounding names so it wouldn't look like the Chinese were doing all the work and the Thais were sitting around doing nothing. And this, this coffee shop was kind of well-organized. It had this general store. It would sell rice, of course, instant coffee, lots of other things. But it, it had a kind of bank teller's cage around the side where for 25% commission, they would give you cash from your account. A very elaborate set of steps happened to get that money back to them from your account, but we didn't have to know about that. They had a little restaurant out the back. I mean, the cells are still really crowded and the conditions are bad, but not really as awful as they were in the other place. Um, they, they, yeah, they had a barber shop with two creaking barber chairs. You could get a haircut. There were Johnny Fontaine pictures on the wall. Um, and... Uh, I, I was given the use of a phone after you know, many months and managed to get through to Michael and I, I started to explain, look, Michael, you, you, know, you won't believe, or you probably will believe too easily what's happened so many. Michael interrupted me. He said, David, look, I can imagine you haven't got much time on this. I don't want to know. Just tell me where I've got to be and what I've got to bring. And that's 
what you like to hear from somebody. Yeah, nice. Your friend who uh, you haven't spoken to, has heard all sorts of stories, but you finally get in touch with you and, you know, says, says those things that only a true friend does. Um, so they, apart from anything else, it was quite moving. Um, but I started to work on lots of plans. Um, I recovered from wanting to kill myself. Um, an American guy, uh, Dean Reed, um, was busy swindling me out of um, some money. He was in a funny kind of, um, what would you call it, accent, uh, kind of Boston Brahmin uh, voice, you know, that, that sort of slightly Kelsey Grammer uh, uh, voice. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he... Uh, he kept saying that I could get, he could, <clears throat> it was on a very short sentence for something a year, um, but he spoke uh, fluent Thai, he um, blended in well. Lots of people came to me and said, oh, you, you can't trust this guy. I mean, we've heard stories about him out there. And I knew that, <clears throat> but it was, and people later on said, look, that guy milked you for money. He went to your friends outside, told them, ridiculous stories about what he was organizing, even um, and tried to go to London uh, and, and see people here, um, you know, for which he, he wouldn't have been doing anything. Who knows what he was? But look, I knew he was tricking me. I knew he was just self-interested, but what else should I expect? Um, I, I didn't know him outside, but I think he deserved his earnings because he gave me hope you know, where there was so hopeless no one had ever won a case or uh, certainly no one that was wanted to fall and no one had done anything but just grimly survive these places for decades if they survived at all there was no way out that policeman was probably right there it just didn't happen and i wasn't going but i was i needed some sense of hope to keep me going anyway um he disappeared in due course after he got up but um i couldn't really even gauge the size of the place it was so big i uh, had a, um, a friend who was a trustee there um he was from laos and uh, but he was the only trust you could tr trust you, you could trust he uh, he didn't take the job seriously. He he really uh, he came to speak to me about it before he took the job. He said he'd been offered it, and uh, should I take it because um, he could help me if, if he had that job. He could move around. Why was he being so helpful? He, you know, some people they look at you and they think they can trust you, and they just want a friend. I mean, you must have come across that, Matthew and. Definitely. Extreme places like prisons. It's funny too, whenever people say to me, like, wow, how did you do 13 years? I, I, I always say, you know, hope. Hope is what gets you through it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's absolutely yeah. true. Um, and not only that, um, but of the people you met, did you stay in touch with many of them? I, <laughs> all my friends are guys I met in prison. I don't no, really, really. Have, I don't have any friends that I out here that I didn't do time with. Right? Isn't that that's, that's funny? <laughs> I, Why? What happened? Uh, what happened to the the old friends? Oh, they were they were never friends to begin with. Yeah, I guess you're right. So, um, what plans were there? I, I think I probably developed about um, fifteen, maybe more uh, plans. There was. <clears throat> one of my favorite ones was escape from the courtroom. And uh, that would be, um, he had the opportunity because the court was in a new building and it was um, quite high, about the 12, 13 floors, and prisoners were taken up in a special lift, a very small one at the side. And I figured somebody, I knew they could get into the building without going through much security or any really, I go to one of the other floors, walk through and intercept this lift as it took me down. So somebody would be in the courtroom to say, yes, he's, he's, he's going to stand, they're taking him away now. So they would be getting ready into position. Another one would say, yes, they've just got into the, the lift there. 
uh, and it's going down. The guy on the, say, the ninth floor from the 12th floor where they'd come from uh, would press the, the button there and the lift would stop. It would open, there'd be two guards in there, unarmed, uh, with me as a prisoner, though I would be chained out. So um, there'd be a bit of work to be done uh, for me to get out of that. But um, as much as I liked that idea, my even the worst villains that I knew, the most serious bank robbers that uh, I'd come across, when they came and um, uh, examined the place, watched all these uh, guards running around with machine guns, they just backed out. And yeah. maybe wisely so, they had been an escape from um, Bang Kwan, where um, some people got away from the, the court transport. The, the prison bus was stopped, um, guys on motorcycles got off and jumped out and let them out, cut them out, had bolt cutters for their chains, all of that sort of thing, took them away on motorbikes. The search for that was so intense when they inevitably got ratted out, um, the, the rangers from the army came in to deal with it. Um, pretty much the only people who profited that day was... Um, uh, the old women who scooped up all the brass casings mm. from the spent shells from their machine guns because the ones that escaped certainly never survived. Um, so that escaping from the, the court um, appearances, that wasn't going to work. I had another plan, even some kind of crazy ones where um, the prison had an auto workshop and I was going to be welded into one of the the vans that a prison guard took in for repair. I didn't really like the idea of being welded in there. Um, and I'm just answering the question on the screen. Um, oh, what's another plan? Oh, yeah, probably the most far-fetched one was um, to be taken out, um, to be one of a disguised as United Nations uh, medical team workers who'd gone to the prison to take out a foreigner. And um, another Swiss guy, Theo, uh, was going to be on the stretcher and uh, Sten from Sweden and I were going to um, have him on there. We'd have the all the UN uniforms and we'd, we'd manage to get out of the, the cell, uh, work that out, um, and figured that just deference to... Um, this foreign force in the United Nations would get our doors open for us, but and that was a bit sketchy, that one. And we couldn't help from sort of cracking up laughing at the thought of it, pretty much. When I got transferred over to this, this better section, the first thing was um, to find a place to spend during the day, which was private, and to get um, effectively a private cell. There was an old one there that was run down, me and a, a Scottish guy, uh, we went to see the, the building chief. Oh, I sat down in his little office. Uh, it's hot in here. What's the matter with your air conditioner? It's not working too good. Look, here's an envelope with some money. You, you get that damn thing fixed. It must be awful for your boss. By the way, there's an empty cell over there. I could, could we fix it up? Yeah, I bet we could get the painters in and have the plastering. So we fixed up this uh, cell. Uh, put in linoleum, uh, I actually got a, a light fitting uh, switch put in place. Nobody had that in the prison. It cost me 5000 uh, I said, look, uh, I just can't sleep at night with that light on. Every other cell had a light on. I just made such a big story about it and um, paid so much for it uh, that he, he agreed to that. So it was, I had um, an office downstairs in, in the art factory and um, this is where they made little pictures out of shells. And I should tell you the way that the prison worked. If, if you were a prison guard and started working in one of the six uh, main sub prisons, the, the chief of that section would bring you in and say, All right, um, what do you want? You've got the sweatshop A, B, or the boot factory, the umbrella factory. And take what you like, they're free. But remember, I want 10,000 a month out of each one. So um, the guard would tell the underling guard, this is your bid. You bring me that money every month. I don't care how you do it. Beat it out of the prisoners, threaten them, sell drugs. Couldn't care what you do. Just make it happen. Um, so they 
um, they didn't really care the guys what you did in the section as long as you kept on paying. Um, so I set myself up a little office there, and soon enough I had um, the guys who picked my ice up for me to go in the ice chest during the day, the guys who organized the food shopping list from the local markets. Um, I didn't go out to do it, of course, but the, there was another guard in charge of um, supplies. So the whole network of things that you paid for, and it sounds like a lot because I probably had, I don't know, what nine staff uh, working for me, people to carry water and God knows what. Um, and when you're saying butler. when you're saying ten thousand dollars, you're saying ten thousand what dollars? Oh, no, no, no. If, if um, this is at 10,000 baht, so you take a zero off that and then uh, divide it by three. So it, it's, it's, about, it's like $300. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Still. Oh, oh but um, yeah, the, the, when talking about the sections that had to deliver, sometimes they'd be higher depending on uh, how many um, prisoners this, this guard was supposed to be looking after. They usually have about, I mean, the worst kind of sections a guard could get would be just the industrial kind of things that had contracts with the prison and that very hard to get any money out of them. One of them, one of the guards there took to uh, beating the laziest prisoner who was a worker of the day every day. So uh, if the laziest one is going to get beaten, it will be somebody. So it doesn't matter how hard the others work. Um, somebody will get beaten. So, uh, um, but guys like that didn't do very well and it also meant they didn't have any money of their own uh, they were drunkards uh, completely or they would have bought themselves a, a better section from which they could get a, a little bit more money the um, the art section where I was where they did these shell paintings uh, really just black and white sketches to make it look like inlaid mother of pearl shells they sold quite well outside uh, particularly uh, portraits of royalty. So the guard there was reasonably happy, but he was a nice drunk too. He used to post my mail for me. Um, I just go over to the table and um, um, slide over the envelopes, and he'd be um, he'd be good enough to put the stamps on them. Uh, just a little button pressing there again. It's asking me about the storage size. Um, that um, I had to kind of restrict the, the number of people that would come and see me because there were a lot of very desperate uh, Westerners there. Um, people who had been beggars around the world, uh, people who had nothing. Um, there were um, people who were, were bored. They, they, I had an electric cooking uh, rings, whereas a lot of them used in the, around the back of the toilet area there, they'd have, um, just old bits of charcoal if they had some money or they just burn anything pieces of plastic to make their meals on you couldn't even breathe around in that section but so i, I was doing kind of all right and uh, fixed the fan in the room um so they wouldn't be suspicious of me at all um i um i wouldn't say i was kind of comfortable but my days weren't awful horrible but i was sticking to I knew they would come to an end this trial would come to an end it would go badly it wasn't going well as it was uh, bits of so-called evidence from uh, newspapers which had covered stories of me in the past like that that first big trial that was being used against me um, I, I, I knew there was no winning eventually um, my uh, Thai lawyer came in and said look um, the agencies, he mainly meant the DA, they're getting sick of waiting. Your trial's going to suddenly come to an end in about uh, two and a half, three weeks. You'll be convicted and you'll be on death row from then on. Um, so I had to really act quick. Out of, um, out of all the plans I've had in reserve, I'd had the one where you just do it in a very straightforward way. You cut yourself out of the cell you climb down the wall, you figure out where the hell the other walls are, and you make yourself a ladder and keep climbing till you get to the edge. And you know, um, it sounds kind of flaky and desperate, and there were so many unknowns, but I knew in the end that was the only way that um, 
really anything was going to work. <clears throat> I'd um, been preparing for it, um, and I I know I could have bought things like hacksaw blades uh, within the prison, sure, but I would have been ratted out, Matthew. Uh, the, the trustees would have, they were such snakes. I mean, they'd sell the drugs one day and then arrest you for it the next. Um, uh, they were absolute toads too. You'd see them during the day as their, their personal guard, the one they worked for, was lying around doing nothing. They'd be massaging the guard's legs to make him more comfortable. And the sickening part was the rapturous look of happiness on the trustee's face as serving my master is but the highest calling in life. Anyway, um, I knew that um, if I got transferred prisons and then had changed to deal with it, it would be much, much harder. I'd have to set up all again. I got some... Um, prisoners allowed a, a kind of care package food parcel from time to time. That would come in by mail and it'd be opened in front of a guard uh, who was seated, in, seated in a chair and everybody would be kneeling around going through this stuff, whatever it was. The ties used to get pretty much a hard time. Their clothes would be soaked in case there were drugs in there somehow, or really just to embarrass them, a way of encouraging payments. Um, the, but the foreigners, because we didn't have local contacts, supposedly, and the parcels came from overseas, they, uh, uh, they kind of let us get away with a bit more. And especially, I always... When I got a parcel, I made sure there was a couple of cartons, extra cigarettes in there, and I used to give some to the guard who was doing the searching. So, yeah, just go along, take your stuff. But um, Michael was going to send me these hacksaw blades, and I, I knew it'd have to make it something good. So I got him to get a huge parcel full of food and tins and clothes and cigarettes and um, uh, books, um, everything you can imagine in there. Uh, so a lot to go through, and it, and it arrived, and uh, he was going through this and that, looking up clothes, and a big roll of gaffer tapes and stationary pens, paper, uh, the, oh, cable ties, you know, oh, hanging up the blankets, I'd say, or whatever. Um, but the even though the hacksaws had been made into, <clears throat> it was a, a scroll, a poster with... A uh, wooden dowel, top and bottom. Inside the dowel was um, the hacksaw blades. I mean, very. Michael had done it really quite well. He'd, um, um, as I'd asked him, he'd, he'd put a cut a groove with a radial arm saw down the the dowel rod, uh, put the uh, hacksaw blades in there, sealed them up, painted them, made the scroll, handwritten the thing, and then. I put it in a special case with inside this, this big care parcel. But I needed one thing to be sure, because I thought it would be a bit heavy or unnatural, and it was. What would you put in that parcel, Matthew, that would distract the guards satisfactorily to get them to take their minds off it? I mean, something that you can give them? Like, you mean, like, cigarettes or whiskey or...? Just to take their mind off it. What I'd said to Michael was, uh, no, whiskey would be a confiscation, so that would be a kind of a, you know, was that, would that be having a dig at them or somewhere? I said to Michael, look, go out and find the most extreme pornography. I was going to say Playboy on. magazines or something, but you're saying even worse. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> something that would really uh, get into the, because they didn't really allow, you know, um, even Playboys uh, were a bit, too much for the for the ties. They're a bit puritanical like that. So when the the guard looked down, they saw these glossy magazines, which was um, what teenage anal number seventeen, um, three way vixens from the Scandinavian porn. Uh, it was oh, he couldn't contain himself. Uh, Daniel was my name in there. Daniel, no, no, sorry, no, cannot have, cannot, oh, cannot have, and very carefully put them under his chair for later. So any thought about what was in that parcel was absolutely dazzled by the shining light of the filthy dreams that he was having suddenly in his head. So I had those. There were some other bits of equipment I, I needed for the, um, 
for the big night. And I'm just rearranging myself a bit here. Um, it's I was doing court, um, and I had every time I was going there, it was very risky. I thought they could suddenly spring it on me. I managed to get through one more court session, but time was running out. Now, I was supposed to leave with this big Swedish guy, you know, the Viking who'd been working out and building up his strength. And I kind of ran through the plan as such as it might be with him. But, you know, it, it was very hard to be convincing. It, it didn't, why hasn't anybody done it before? And I, I never really liked hearing that. So um, uh, I said, because it wouldn't work so easy if somebody had done it before. They would have patched up some of the holes they've got in their security. No, no, no. He, he was a very much of two minds. But the real reason was, after you get out, uh, where do you go? You've got a plan for that. And he had no one or nothing because he, he was a bit of a scallywag, a scoundrel. He'd, he'd um, stolen from his friends and um, done bad things out there. Um, but... Um, what really killed it for him, I was down near the, the coffee shop, General Store, and these couple of guys walked along, newcomers. <clears throat> they had, not only were they wearing the heaviest chains I've ever seen, but um, their legs were just all distorted and they were hobbling. Um, like, like they were both sort of crippled or some kind. Um, that had been badly treated, and yet they were Europeans. Well, they looked like that way. It turned out they were Israelis. They'd been uh, rested in this much smaller town of Chiang Mai. It's only 250,000, or it was at the time. They'd been taken to the local lockup, and they'd got out of there. It wasn't such a hard thing to do. They'd gone to the guest house where they'd been staying um, because they thought they trusted the guy. The guy milked them of all their money and eventually ratted them out to the cops. And, and the cops let the guards have them back and they took them back to the jail and then smashed all their legs with iron bars, mm. put them in a dungeon, threw rocks on top of them. It was only in the strength I get, I mean, both of them being in the Israeli army, um, had um, allowed one to drag the other one out and give him some water and they survived. So when they came back, they were... Um, I wouldn't say on the way to recovery, but but they lived anyway. Now, I mean, you can imagine the pain of uh, unset, broken limbs. Uh, anyway, the, um, <laughs> they they've been transferred down because the security wasn't tight enough up there. Of course, they uh, now when what was I going to tell Sten the Viking about this? The Westerners and they still half beat them to death. You know, I, I kind of went up to him and said, oh, it would make the funniest things, Then the, These guys have um, got out of the, the prison and they fucked it up. I mean, not like we're going to, you know, we'll be all right because I've organized this and that. Well, there was no amount of talking about uh, that this was to be dismissed. He, he just wouldn't come along, which in the end was um, a better thing. Um I switched off my light for the last time in that cell just as midnight came around. And the cell's only about five people by this time. I'd gone to great lengths to keep people out. Uh, I had to give the chief a lot more money because normally even the small cell held about 14, but this was just five. Myself, an Indian people smuggler, who um, he was mild enough, but a complete coward, so I'd have to watch him. Um, Kevin from Hawaii, or Calvin, it was called sometime, um, myself and Stan, and that was it. Um, so I switched off that light and then got the hacksaws out and then started to go to work. Well, I'd had the hacksaws broken from this thing and hidden somewhere else. So, um, but there was other things. Like the, the, there were no beds in there, but there were kind of little mats and mine was made up of a crosshatch woven pattern. It was actually 100 meters of army boot webbing from the army boot factory, that nylon cord. Um, a couple of other little things put together. Um, but I found there was a, a very, 
it was almost like it was starting to get too late by the time I'd um, got everything ready um, and woken up uh, Kevin very surprised to see what was going on. Uh, oh yeah, the, the little boy, my uh, head butler was in there as well. Um, he, it, it was starting to get late. It was after one o'clock. I took the hacksaws out and started cutting, but it was um, much noisier than you can imagine. You know, when you're timing something in your mind, well, you don't know how long it's going to take, but it never really factored for the sound, so I had to cut much slower. Even oil just made the cutting slower rather than doing a good job. So um, it, by about 2.45 in the morning, um, I'd only got to the point uh, where one, the top part of one bar was cut, halfway through the, the lower section of the same bar, uh, and that was bending a bit. But I, I knew how old the whole building was and under what strain it was. As I cut through the, the top bar, well, extended, I let him do the, the cutting, um, it sprang away from where it was because it had been in position so long and the whole building had skewed and all of that. Um, he'd said, oh, look, stay another um, day, you know, that nobody will come here or interfere, we'll put everything back. I knew it just wouldn't work. People had all come unstuck because uh, somebody spoke, and this Indian guy, he was weak and terrified, and, and he would have spoken for sure. So um, I went on with it. It would have been, I had to just stop all of that and put a, a I had an old builder's plank, which was being used as a bookshelf. I slid that out of a, uh, the window. Um, and it had to be locked in place because this plank couldn't go out flat and then bounce around. It had to go out sideways. And then look, they put us up three floors up because they didn't trust foreigners on the ground floor, that's for sure. Um, and uh so i had to make my way to the ground after that so this plank had to go sideways sten climbed up there grabbed this bar that had been half cut and stretched it back just as i stripped down and slid out uh, to, to the end of the plank going hand over hand to the back of it um with one arm slung this army boot webbing over both sides and then grabbed it thinking, oh, well, I'll abseil to the ground. Well, that that plan was never going to work. Um, unless you've abseiled before, it's not so easy to do. But the odd thing was, when I got out of that cell, when I, when I squeezed through the bar into the night and looked up at the sky that I hadn't seen for what, almost two and a half years, I'd never seen a night sky, I'd never seen stars or anything, and then look back into the cell with the people I knew in there. I thought suddenly it was all finished. It was all gone. That didn't matter anymore. My survival out here was what mattered. And here I am clinging to the wall like some big insect. Um, You're still in the prison. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just out of my cell at building six and there's seven more buildings to go through. Uh, and, uh, and look, I, I slid to the ground and um, burnt the skin off my, my fingers doing so and, and, and rolled over and it, it was soft ground, so it was fine. I pulled back that, that rope down and rolled it up and then went to my daytime office. And there I opened up a cupboard uh, which had um, six picture frames in there. Sten, I'd had him pretend to take an interest in oil painting and he put together these wooden um, frames you know, over which you stretch the canvas normally, but they were no more than frames. And they were to be the rungs of a ladder I had in mind making using uh, four, two ladders, uh, four um, long bamboo poles from another factory. This was the factory that made uh, paper paintings of little fake boxes for Chinese funerals. And they hung them over to dry on these long bamboo poles, which were about uh, 12 feet, 14 feet long, two inches down on the base, uh, tapered to about an inch. 
but I still had to get there. And so I, I bundled up the little things that I would need uh, from my little office room in the art factory and had a look around to see what guards were about. One I could see already sleeping over in the corner. I usually had a bit of a drink and went to sleep, these guys. But it wouldn't take much to wake him up. And it was so slow. As I, look, I timed this out during the day and walked a few steps and then had my watch telling me um, uh, how long it took to go from one place to another. Um, all that meant nothing on the actual night. On the night, it took forever to go somewhere. I didn't want to make any noise. I couldn't drop anything. I couldn't put things down. I had to make sure I was keeping on carrying it. Where the bamboo poles came from, that was a factory that had just been sealed up, so I had to break into that. And even the sound of my old uh, um, parrot beak pliers that I'd nicked from somewhere uh, was slow on it. <clears throat> so um, I did get into that factory, um, put down the poles either side, put the picture frames along them, taped them up with the gaffer tape holding a, a little torch in my teeth, my mouth was either drying out or drooling, holding this torch in my teeth as I was doing it. You know, I, I, not even really wanting to look at the time, because I know it's three o'clock in the morning by then, or after that. I've now got two ladders all taped up. I can't get them out of the factory, because the way I came in was too close to where the guards were, so I had to actually break out the other end of this factory, um, down where it went on to where the auto shop was. So use one of the ladders to climb up to the roof inside the factory, poke the other ladder through the, the gap in the mesh and the tin, lower it down into the auto shop, pull the other one up, lower that one down, carry the two of them to the auto shop gate, which led on to where the, the showers and the water tanks and the toilets were in Building 6, knowing that there were many other buildings to go to, and I didn't really know where they were. Um, even... By the time I rounded one of the corners, the um, guard was moving and I had to wait for a bit. I eventually got um, <clears throat> to the inside wall of Building 6, which had its own barbed wire. I'd had a fifth bamboo pole and I taped an S-hook around that with some of the gaffer tape, pulled that uh, rolls of kind of old and effective barbed wire. It was ineffective, but it still tangled you up. Uh, and pulled that outwards. Um, so that it, I could get my ladder um, over to the edge of it. Now, by this stage, I realized carrying two ladders wasn't going to work. I taped them both together, and I pushed them up against this internal wall, climbed to the top, and then lowered to the bottom and tried to pull it through, but it was still tangling. I had to develop a bit of a system to get over these internal walls. And I'd get into one building, and the open courtyard and grassy area, the exercise field or whichever I could find myself in. I had to avoid building five because it was the punishment section and very small, so I went to the next one. Was that building three? I don't know. <laughs> uh, and had a thing where I'd keep this long ladder with the two of them joined together, hold it in the middle and trot along like a pole vaulter. Um, Michael had taught me that about pole vault. He used to be a Commonwealth champion pole vaulter before he gave up one life and took on another. Um, I stopped looking at my watch or, and, and really um, didn't keep track so much of, of where I was. But I knew I was heading in the right direction when a smell from the AIDS ward. AIDS was uh, ripping through Thailand at the time and, and prisoners uh, uh, heavily affected. They put them in a virtually disused section of the uh, prison compound and they were rotting away in there so you could smell them from a distance so mm. I knew if I was near them I must be close I even stuck my head up and looked in and saw these grey shiny sick faces just looking at me but you know they, they didn't say anything and any other Thai prisoner would have screened the place down the local the, the cell boss, the, the little trustees on the, the wing would have blown their whistles till their lungs exploded if they saw me out there. But these guys dying in an agony just didn't didn't have the strength to, to say anything. But I knew I was only two buildings away from the outer wall. 
um, amid a couple of other obstacles, uh, it's kind of long to explain, but one was just a, a wall of barbed wire and I had to go under the mud in that one. So it was pretty messy by the time I reached that, the inside of the outer wall. And it had a, another moat on the inside of the prison that ran around, it was actually a sewer. And that had barbed wire in the middle and I couldn't figure a way of getting um, my ladder over to the other side because the other side where the wall was, where I had to be, where I had to put my ladder against it, that only had about a foot and a half of ground underneath it. Um, and I had to like devise a, a plan to get over there. Um, <laughs> I guess um, oh, I found a way. I found a way. And those who want more detail on my exploits can probably uh, read the last book I wrote. But the um, I did find myself propped up against that outer wall between the guard towers as dawn was coming. That glow was in the sky. And I, mm. and I reached up there and looked over. The original plan was to somehow get over and safely down to the ground on the other side and um, swim the moat. But I realized finally when I was looking at it that to swim to where? This was all guards houses. Um, so uh, it was kind of a mess. I used the last of my drinking water to clean myself up, put on my long trousers because they were never allowed. And the ones I'd had, I kept aside were khaki, so um, maybe from a distance I might look like a guard, except <laughs> what with a white face? No, I don't think so. Um, managed to very carefully inch my way through the um, electric cables there, uh, and taking the chance that the, the the rubber of my trainers would insulate me pretty well, and it, and it did. And again, the last of my little bit of rope. Uh, to see me to the, to the bottom, the inside track, the little path that ran around the jail. Now, going across the moat wasn't going to work. The only way out was to, and I realized it was in the wrong place, not where I thought I'd end up, not at the back of the prison, but in fact near the front. Um, I realized I'd have to walk around the front and cross one of the small footbridges that went over uh, that path. I pulled up my uh, ace in the hole, as they say. It was one of my jobs that I was supposed to work out inside the prison, but never did. It was in the, um, the umbrella making factory where they made pop up umbrellas. I'd taken um, a black pop up umbrella with me on my little journey through the prison because I thought, look, oh, if I'm in this situation and I'm going to be passing people, what is one thing that escaping prisoners don't have, don't use, don't think about if there's rain? An umbrella. So I popped that up, kept my head under it, walked my way in a kind of reasonable but relaxed uh, pace, and even poked out looking up to see whether the guard towers were watching. Two weren't, but one was, and he probably wondered, who the hell's that coming in on the... Uh, the backside path. But as I said, the, the guards lived over that side, so I'd hoped and perhaps he thought that it was a, a late coming prison officer who was sneaking in the back way to avoid being bawled out by his boss. But in any event, I rounded the corner, found the little moat crossing that goes over the front where the stalls were setting up, their breakfast goods, their coffees, their baked donuts, the goods they'd sell for people visiting prisons. Um, went over that. I even think uh, my personal guard, the one who I'd leave with uh, one of my ATM cards that uh, I'd send him out every month for cash from the ATM, give him an honest 10%. I think it was he who was arriving, and he couldn't see my face, of course, but, you know, when you know somebody and the way they walk, there's something about their footsteps that kind of reminds you of who it is, and maybe he had some I wouldn't have even thought possibly it was me, but something about it. But I moved away from there fast enough and got to the main road, climbed the big old steel pedestrian crossing over the six-lane highway, one of which goes to the airport and the other one back into town. I climbed, I turned around and, and looked 
back at the prison and thought to myself, why are they doing it? Why are they staying there? They just why are, <laughs> why are the why prisoners are, staying there? Why, why do they choose oh. to live there for 20 <laughs> years and, and not try everything they can possibly do to get out? I made arrangements for a passport to be kept hidden from me by um, the guy I mentioned before, that the only good trustee in the whole prison, the one who was from Laos, he was getting out and he, uh, though he was deported, he was back quick enough and came to see me. And when I was making arrangements for a passport um, to be ready for me with him, he was saying, look, David, you've got no chance of this, really none. I'll come and see you as the years go on. Don't worry, I'll come and bring you things. And I know this guard and that one, you know, I'll always be able to organize something. I, it is not, I can't do that. I'd rather die trying on this. Just please put that passport where it is. And by the way, you know you have to uh, get it stamped into the country a few weeks beforehand and it's got to be on the computer and got to be this and got to be that. And the only photograph I can give you for that to make this thing up is my old uh, radio operator's license, from the, which I got many years ago, so it's a little bit old. Yes, 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 yes. So um, he explained to me uh, where it would be kept and gave me a key, but I often wondered, would he do it? Right. That's what um, I was thinking. He thought it was so hopeless. Yeah, I know. He, uh, and, and he had to, you know, call in some of the people who are in the, in the people smuggling business and, and, you know, getting them to go out to their man at the airport and get on the computer and everything like that. Um, but he did give me the key to this place, so I thought, yeah. And he seemed so, so genuine. Anyway, um, I didn't have time to stay on that footbridge and look back at the prison all morning. I thought I'd better get the hell out of it. Uh, climbed down the other side, hailed a taxi, took him to the local shopping centre, got rid of him, went around the back side of it, got another taxi, got to this um, block of apartments, the flats that I didn't really know anything much about found number uh, 64 put the key in opened it well the doors open that's a good thing um there's actually some boy staying there he seemed to know of me or didn't know that i might be coming but knew knew something about me um he said oh did you get bail or something like that i said yes sir something like that. Look, I just need to use the toilet because that's where this thing was supposed to be. I went in the toilet cubicle. Sure enough, there was a, um, I, I was too dehydrated to take a pee, but uh, there was a mirror as described um, behind the assistant tank. And I felt down along that. Yeah, my fingers have touched something. Is it an envelope? Maybe. And I, I, I pulled it out and there was something in there. And, it felt good, and I'm thinking, what are the odds that a guy I've met in prison has got out of the prison, gone and had my, I knew this photo wasn't even the right size uh, for a, uh, a passport, it had to be adjusted and everything like that, and all the things put on the, anyway, I opened it up and I had a look, and sure enough, there was me staring back at me, and it was a British passport, um, nicely used, uh, good enough and had been stamped in and the papers for the um that you have to fill out before you leave at the airport uh, that had been done three weeks before by the uh, immigration officer as a tourist thing they were all in there sitting there ready to go um i thought well i'd give you a kiss if you were here now so uh, i didn't waste any time i remembered the, the vision of the broken legs of the israelis stayed within my mind mm -hmm. um so I went down, jumped in another taxi, um, and uh, arrived at the airport. Now, before I'd left the cell uh, the night before, I was a bit worried about my head butler, who was only like five and a half feet tall, how he'd be treated the next day. And I extend some money, I said, look, see what you can do, make sure. And I, I gave him my good watch, and I kept my little crabby Casio that actually kept better time. Um, because I, I turned around in the middle of the night of all this cutting away, and there he was, a little jet, that was his name. Uh, it means number seven, because he was the seventh child. He was not dressed 
as he normally would be for sleeping. He was at his Sunday go to meet and clothes. He, he, he was all dressed up and he had uh, um, his best shoes on uh, and he had his letters and photos and his personal things all in a plastic bag with a rubber band. He was ready to go with me, you know, follow me anywhere. And I thought to myself, here you are, a bit braver than uh, my Swedish friend who shit himself at the prospect of being a free man. But um, I had to, you know, both Sten and I explained to him, no, 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 look, you can't go tonight. We're, and David's going, you, you, you can't follow, uh, not not this night. And I said, look, I'll, I'll send you money. I'll, I'll do my best for you, whatever you want. You're not doing a long time. You don't want to be wanted, being shot at or whatever. Um, and kind of reluctantly, he'd... he'd um, He'd settled down. So, um, and, and where would he have gone anyway? There were, um, I'd, there were, the point of this is I'd gotten rid of most of my cash. So the two ATM cards that I still had, I uh, had to work um, really to give me some flexibility about where I was going to go. I headed up the, the bank, put one in, tapped it up. I thought, well, Okay, it's probably best to go to a European country. It's a long haul, it's going to be at least 12 hours, but I'd be into a jurisdiction where I could put up an argument for, you know, even if something or other led to me being identified or this passport falls to bits or, or whatever. Right. Um, and I'm not really looking at the screen, and I don't want to look at the screen, you know, because it's saying, please refer to your bank. And I can tell you when you escape from a prison and you depend on your life for the money that comes out of an ATM. To get that message on the screen is not something you want to see. <laughs> so I had one more card, though. So I gave it a, a rest, and I didn't want to use the machine straight away. Um, I went down to the long-term uh, luggage lockers where uh, a visiting friend had left an overnight bag um, with a change of clothes and some toiletries and collected that. It had been sitting there for two and a half months already came back to the machines and put um, put the second card in um, after thinking through some options, but none of them were very good. Um, staying in the country, whatever. No, the second card paid out about $500. So where could I go on that? Not far. I bought a ticket because time was on the march to the next Singapore flight that was going out. Now, um, Singapore's <laughs> close enough by in terms of time, but it not so good in t terms of jurisdiction. They would have sent me back to Thailand immediately. They have the death penalty of their own. They wouldn't have <laughs> bothered about extradition courts. Uh, I wouldn't be a citizen of theirs. I'd be on a phony passport anyway, wouldn't they? So sending me back would have been no trouble. Um, but I, I'm in the line already for um, departure. And at every point, I'm waiting for something to go wrong. If I stick my head above, when I was back in there, above the parapet of the, the, the roof of a wall, turn a corner and I see somebody and I'm confronted by them and I can't get out of it. Um, so even at the airport, um, I'm having trouble getting the money. And then I, I bought a ticket and I've checked in uh, and I'm going to the immigration desk, and uh, the guy behind the desk there has, has got this new passport, which, you know, um, he's typed up, the forms are right, he's tapping on the screen, you know, the keyboard, he's frowning at it, there's a pause, and I'm thinking, well, this is where it all ends. Yeah, it's got right. To, yeah. It's a um, fake passport, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a real passport, stolen within a few weeks ago. But, okay. But um, who knows? If some other mechanism had had it, you know, they explained to me that there's thousands and thousands of passports stolen or lost every year. If they put all the stolen or lost ones onto uh, a list, then every time somebody, oh, I found that passport I reported missing last week. All right, let's go off to the airport. And it'll blow up on them. And right. so they don't put all of those on a, a big list because there'd be millions of them uh, right. for every country you go through. The only ones, the only people on a list. Um, uh, is a watch list, and that's very limited. It's that country's wanted felons. It's um, 
people have been requested being put up there by Interpol and even most countries wish Interpol would keep their business to themselves because unless it's a red notice, it usually doesn't go on there. Uh, red notices are notified and arrest on site and all of that kind of thing. Um, the, anyway, as I'm speculating on all this stuff, I've missed the sound of the immigration officer stamping my passport and handing it back. I've gone on board and uh, the flight's delayed and the airline steward, what would you like? Some water, please. <laughs> Definitely a bit dried out by then. But the captain mumbling something about something with one passenger and sorry, the delay won't be long while well, I sort this out. I think, yeah, yeah, that one passenger, that's me and they're coming for me. <laughs> Thwomp. A very satisfying sound again of the doors closing and somebody muttering doors to manual, as they say, uh, before the plane takes off. And it did, and it was only an hour's flight. But what have I got to do during that hour? Uh, I've got nothing to read except this thinking passport. <laughs> mm. And I tell you what, I don't like it any better than I did when I first saw it after an hour. I kept finding faults in it, you know, the, the stitching, uh, the, the binding, the, the laminate over the, the photo. I didn't think much of it. And uh, I was not alone in that opinion when I landed in Singapore and I went to the immigration desk there, the officer on duty looked at this passport. And, uh, this photo is not a, a first generation photo, it's a copy of one. Why would anybody do that? Mm. And he has slid it over to the ultraviolet uh, lamp. And in the case of British passports, um, they're looking for the green glow of the uh, imprinting on the covers. And he's put the photo part of it under there. Oh, yes. And I'd forgotten it needs to show three little crowns uh, overlapping the edges in pink. And Bless my little Chinese friend, Laotian friend, three little crowns in pink showed up there. And the passport officer gave me a passport, stamped it, gave it back to me. Almost as much as to say, look, I know it's a stinker and it's a fake, but it passed the UV test, so I'm in the clear. Go about your business, be it good or bad. <laughs> right. And I was out of there. I took a, a taxi straight out, dumped that in the center of town, took another one found a three-star hotel. You don't want five-star, the security is a big flash. You want a big shots in there, nosing around, you don't want to be looked at. You don't want a one-star hotel, some dump where there's connivers and scammers all trying to get a hold of you. Now, a three-star sort of commercial traveler's regular, decent hotel is just fine. Went there, checked in. As I was checking in at the desk, I'm thinking this thing, Passport's got to go soon. <laughs> McClintock was his name. Um, George McClintock. Uh, I thought, George, you and I are going to have to part ways soon. But anyway, I wasn't really concerned about that that day. It had been a long one. So I threw my stuff in my room, went down to the um, the hotel shop, bought, uh, bought a pair of swimming trunks, and grabbed a towel and went straight up to the a rooftop where they had the swimming pool. Got it, stood on one end, dived in for the most relaxing, peaceful, deep, hugging the ground of the pool swim I've ever had and surfaced on the very other end of the pool. Heaved myself up as the, the f relatively fresh chlorinated water of the swimming pool ran from me rather than the stinking sludge of some Bangkok clong. Mm -hmm. and looked over the railing and wondered, well, where to next? <laughs> and that really dealt with uh, Bangkok. You know, very strange to be within the space of 24 hours, uh, really 16 hours really, um, in a horrible prison where I'm not likely to survive or certainly be in any shape and stay forever or death um, to being a free man with a different identity in a hotel that no one knew about. Um, a strange feeling indeed, but 
worthwhile. So I enjoyed that before. Well, what would you have done next, huh? Uh, <laughs> I said, I'd have gotten out of that country. I would have gotten, tried to get, like you said, tried to get to a European country. Well. And get myself a better passport. Yeah. You know, I didn't have a very good sleep that night even as a free man because I was thinking, how can they work out who I am, where I am? I mean, you put yourself in the in the shoes of um, not so much the the ties. They wouldn't. They're not really great investigators in that sense. They've got no reason to be. My enemies, the Bill Shankman from the USDA, or some bored Australian. Uh, I couldn't imagine the British doing anything. They never make an effort. But how would you figure out who I was? Would there? Can you think of any? technique that would reveal my name i'm just pressing another button here <clears throat> i mean the the well i mean <laughs> hey that was david mcmillan and we're gonna have him back on for the second part of his story and it is another escape from a death sentence i really appreciate you guys watching do me a favor if you like the video hit the subscribe button Hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Share the video. Leave me a comment in the comment section. And we're also going to leave David's uh, book the, in the description box. We're going to leave the link for his book. Uh, I believe it's on Amazon. Um, also, if you like the videos and you want to help support the channel, please check out my Patreon. It's $10 a month. That's nothing. See ya.